Reading. Hmm. Call the meeting to order for the North Reading School Committee, October 16th, 2017. First order of business is public input. Seeing none. Um, before we uh, get to our agenda, I want to welcome Michael Scannell tonight. He'll be the new uh, reporter covering us for the North Reading transcript, and we look forward to working with Mike. So thanks, thanks a lot, Mike. For we were we were worried we we're going to be left uh, we were going to be left uncovered. So You're we're glad to have you here. Thanks. Okay, uh, next student report. We have Michael Terrell, who is a junior at the high school. Michael. Hey. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Tyrell. So just to jump right into things, I mean, our athletic teams, I mean, as per usual, they're doing, they're doing really, really well. The football team, as many of you, I hope, know, emerged victorious in the Cape Ann League uh, on Friday. They defeated uh, Masconomet Regional High School 20 to 14. I mean, it was a thrilling game. Uh, Masconomet, I mean, at the end, uh, they almost had it. They almost had the victory, but uh, a stroke of luck allowed us to win it in overtime. Uh, oh, I, they missed, so there was six seconds left, and Masconov had attempted a 22-yard field goal, it was 22, yeah. which was wide left. And there were like a thousand penalty flags, and everybody thought North Reading was offside, yeah. and it was um, illegal motion against Masconov. So mm. it's unbelievable. And then we run into OT. Yeah. He scored a touchdown. Great. It's great. Um, I mean, hopefully they can progress even further than last year, in which they reached the semifinals. That was an amazing result, but I think you know they can even go further this year. Uh, in the state tournament. I mean, our success isn't just limited to football. The girls' soccer team and volleyball team are both one win away from entering their respective state tournaments. Our teams not only uh, bring success to the school, but also maintain our values and excellent principles. The golf team was awarded the Cape Ann League Sportsmanship Award. Lastly, senior night for boys' soccer was last Thursday, where they defeated Linfield 2-1. And field hockey has senior night actually at 7 tonight, so coming up. Uh, these athletic success successes are in part due to our excellent new facilities, such as the weight room, which allow our, our amazing athletes numerous resources to improve. And our new facilities don't just, are not just limited to acad um, athletic success, um, but also uh, they promote the fine arts, such as through the Large Performing Arts Center. During the first 10 days of December, on the 1st, 2nd, 8th, and 9th, the high school maskers will put on Beauty and the Beast, which they've been uh, diligently preparing for us, and I think that'll be an excellent performance when it does come. Also on November 4th, uh, the Friends of Horner Productions is sponsoring the annual Holiday Marketplace on Main Street, another example of our school's facilities benefiting the larger community. The proceeds here will go to the middle school arts programs. Yeah. A number of clubs and other extracurricular activities uh, have hosted <laughs> events uh, recently. The Student Council hosted the New Teacher Luncheon on October 6th, where they welcomed the new teachers to the high school. Uh, the Student Council also sent a small delegation of students to Officer Shop, uh, which is a program in which they learn leadership skills um, and hopefully bring those back to our council, uh, including one student council member who also doubles as a student representative, Elizabeth Barrett. I think you'll meet her later this year. <coughs> the Student Council is also hosting the food drive to support the North Reading Food Pantry during the highly demanding holiday season. As many of you know, um, the food drive actually says they gain many of their much of their food supplies through donations. So it's really important that we support this. So far, we've raised um, 1,200 items of the 6,000 goals, so we're, we're directly on our path to complete that. The Indirect Club has also hosted the Hats for Hurricanes fundraiser and raised over $550 to support the efforts of the Red Cross in Puerto Rico, Texas, and Florida after the devastating hurricanes there. There is also going to be a speaker for International Club this Wednesday. In addition to the number of clubs and athletic activities going on, there have been a number of programs to support students that are going to take place the next month and have been taking place. Financial Aid Night, uh, hosted by the High School Guidance Department, will, be, will take place this Thursday, the 19th. On November 9th, the Reality Fair will also take place, which will help junior students explore potential career opportunities. Last Wednesday, the film Screenagers was shown to educate parents on how to best assimilate technology into their busy lives and their, in their uh, sons and daughters' busy lives. <coughs> There's a panel after the film as well, yeah. uh, which two student representatives, Bridget Grew, I think you met uh, a few weeks ago, and me participated in. Senior students have also begun to apply to college on early decision, and college representatives continue to speak at guidance. Lastly, there are a number of programs to aid students to manage their stress, um, and those are being implemented uh, as the school year goes on, Mr. Votto, a math teacher and uh, junior varsity soccer coach for the boys, hosts a mindfulness and health and wellness session 
on uh, school, uh, after school on Tuesdays. And Power Down is also a program during Power Block that consists of yoga and also other physical activities. I mean, as you can see, there's so many activities going on that benefit all spheres of our student body, which is excellent. And you know, a lot of this comes from our new facilities and just excellent, diligent work about not only our students, but also our teachers. And I have one piece of solid work, uh, student work for you all. It is solid, I tell you. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say, we'll be the judge. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's from my <coughs> APUS history class. Um, we simply had to use pieces of evidence we'd gathered from class uh, through various documents and write an introductory paragraph with a thesis and then various topic sentences with supporting details. Kind of a skeleton of an essay, so to speak. And it's pretty short and there's a rubric on the back, just a typed out rubric. So I'll just pass that around. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Michael? Oh, good job, Mike. And uh, get an A plus from me. You mentioned the new facilities four times. Exactly. So I, uh, <laughs> Always a goal. I greatly know. appreciate and that. And that they're used yeah. by the entire community, yes. not just yes. the school on a uh, from you know from seven to three or whatever. I mean, it really is. It makes the, yeah. the, this area hub. You know what I right. mean? All sorts of activities go on all the time. There still could be more use, but we're starting to use it more. Um, on, a, on a regular basis. What was so. that date, Mike, in the holiday market? Was it November 4th? Or? I think, yeah, November 4th. 4th. Okay. The girls, uh, I know girls soccer play today against Rockport, so if they won, they qualify for the... Uh, Jerlyn was in, Jerlyn was predicting a win at our meeting this well, evening. She did predict a win. <laughs> Jerlyn's on a scoring streak. I know. Yeah, Jerlyn is. She Nine is. Nine goals? She is. Wow. She is. And, and I do have to say, that football game was incredibly exciting. Yeah. And... Uh, it was kind of cool because the, they let the kids and the parents, after about five minutes when the, with the coaches talking to the players, they let the kids go onto the field. field? And uh, yeah, because it, it was a big win. Masco, it's a big upset. Masco was ranked number three in Division Two. Particularly where they have us now in that Division right. Three right. Uh, tournament right. uh, seating there. That's going to be tough. So yeah. anyway, thanks, Michael. Yep. Thank you. No problem. Okay. And we're going to switch the agenda around a bit. We're going to skip <laughs> over the. Um, MSBA SSBC update for now. I wish we could kind of skip over it forever. It's been on the agenda for about six years. Um, and we're going to go to new business. We have three um, separate proposals tonight. First, we'll call up Ms. Allison Kane, who is performing arts teacher, renowned leader of the maskers, among other things, head of the Beauty and the Beast. Yes. No, uh, you can actually, we can just come, just get you a microphone. So, yeah, it probably is better if you come up here, sit up here. And Allison's going to talk to us about a um, overnight trip to New York City for students of the Performing Arts program. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Allison Kane, and um, I'm here to talk about um, the uh, Performing Arts um, trip to New York City that we're proposing. So, every couple of years, we try to take um, an educational trip um, and. Um, give our students an opportunity to go into the real world and try um, their hand in the performing arts field. Um, we find New York City covers every base that we need there. So um, uh, over a weekend in April, so a Saturday and a Sunday, um, we'd like to leave early in the morning. We take a chartered bus with 55 students. Um, actually, it's 50 students and five chaperones. Um, and uh, we get there, we uh, stay at um, a hotel in Times Square. We've had a relationship with them now for 10 years. Um, we like to see a matinee. We normally have a talk back where they meet the actors. My tech people go backstage and work with like a stage manager or, or someone in the field. Um, the um, instrumentalists can work with orchestra. You know, so we try to cover all bases in the performing arts. Um, we have dinner planned um, at Buco de Beppo together. And then at night, there's some time to look around Times Square um, some students like to want to uh, try to see another show so they can always add on an additional show. We have enough chaperones to split the group in two. If there's enough students to want to do that, I personally would see another show in a heartbeat. So I would do that. Um, we stay overnight one night. Um, we take a Broadway class in the morning. So one of the shows that we see, we get to meet those actors and then we get one-on-one -on -one hands time with those um, performers. They can teach them everything from something from their show to how to audition, to how to build or how to do stage makeup or or stage combat, there's some variety um, depending on the student's interest. Um, we have another little break to look around Times Square again. We meet up for lunch, we see another show, and then we head back home and uh, time for bedtime Sunday night. 
Um, we, like I said, it's a 55 passenger bus that we take. Um, we offer fundraising opportunities for the students. Our music boosters do help us out with fundraising as well as uh, myself and Eric Foreman. And some of the options that we have, um, we do caroling and choral grams. We have a big band fundraiser we're gonna try in February this year. We sell Yankee Candle, um, we <coughs> bake sales. So um, we, try to, we try to defray at least half the cost. Sometimes with candy caning, kids can defray all the cost depending on how how much they sell with their fundraisers. Any questions for Allison? No, it's a ambitious itinerary. Yeah. Oh, it's By the time they get home, they're gonna be tired. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I wanna go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to know why. Why do they need a dollar when you check into the hotel? Um, so uh, one dollar. That's one dollar. That's one the dollar. the baggage holding fee. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there, if our rooms aren't ready, we have to be ready to pay a dollar per bag. Per bag. Yeah. Right. I didn't think you get anything for a dollar anymore. So, yeah, that's <laughs> right. A, that's a good deal. Yeah. Man. And we only use backpacks too. So I mean, in the past they haven't charged us, but it is in the contract that it says you must have a dollar per per bag if they have to hold on to them and the rooms aren't ready. And in, in the past, have these trips been completely booked? Full? Completely booked. Uh, I'm very willing to take a separate bus if we can fill that bus I up. Say, do you have more than 50 that want to go? Um, we have had more than 50 that want to go. Uh, it's it, it's a little cost prohibitive if we don't Second we bus. can't fill up a full bus. Right, right, right. But if we can get close, about two thirds or so, then we can take a separate bus. So you won't cap it at just one bus mm -hmm. if you say you have 75 kids or 80 kids that want to go? If there's 80 kids, we can take two buses, absolutely. Yeah, if, if there's 57 kids, we can't take yeah. that. Yeah. And of course, 80 kids would mean eight chaperones. Absolutely, so. a one in 10 ratio. Okay. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Okay, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve the overnight trip to New York for the performing arts students. So moved. Second. Motion by Julie, second by Janine. Any further questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. December 1st is sneaking up pretty quick. What? There's something going on? <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, it's coming. I'll see you all there. Uh, we will. Thanks right. very much. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have two North Reading students, Kyle Bythrow and Michael Brown, and they're here to propose a new high school extracurricular club called Students for Soldiers. Hi, I'm Michael Brown. I'm a senior. And I'm Kyle Bythrow. I'm also a senior here at North Reading High School. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to ask how many of you have either a family member or someone close to you that's in the military. And we ask that while we go through this PowerPoint, you keep them in mind and just how much they would enjoy receiving something like this. So our mission statement is to make sure no soldier is left alone during mail call. So when we were um, brainstorming ideas and we were talking to local bases, one thing that um, Mr. Downs, the vice principal, brought up was that um, there are some soldiers that when he was deployed that they don't get anything from home. And that, I mean, there are some soldiers that just get flooded with things from home that just makes their deployment easier so our main goal is to make sure you know every soldier is you know they feel like they've been thanked and that they you know what they do for our country is just a, 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 like amazing and that they they know that um, students for soldiers is we would start a club and we want to fundraise by selling t-shirts or um, bake sales or other things that the club members could think of and have people write letters and to send out and the fundraising money would go towards um, care packages to send out to bring to bases. So our major events would be Christmas letters to soldiers. There's so many soldiers out there that I, I do know other clubs do do that. It's just there's there isn't as many people in here as there are soldiers that are deployed, so there would be some we could send to. Um, selling student-made t-shirts and then annual care packages. And some of the care packages would just have like simple toiletries, you know, snacks, things from home that, uh, that isn't perishable. 
and then other things just like like magazines, socks, gum, stuff like that. Just like cheap things, but that, but just something that would just make them, you know, um, accustomed to like U.S. products, and many of them are overseas or they don't have U.S. products. Uh, this is just an example of some of the things they could bring in. So the main question is why do you want to start this club is what I've been asked. And for me, it's, I have um, a cousin that just joined the Marines and he's studying language. So he's going to be a translator for Arabic. And I had two relatives that were, um, my, both my uncles are Marines. And that the, the one thing that they always talked about was just letters from home is what like made them just, just want to keep going on. Because they said sometimes it can be depressing. Like sometimes it can be boring. Sometimes there isn't anything to do. And just little like glimpses from home just make things better. And just personally, I just feel like that's just, to me, the mil people in the military, I have so much respect for them just for what they do for our country. They put their lives on the line. They leave their loved ones for extended periods of time. And just uh, like the, the little small thing just to make their day better just mean extraordinary amounts to me. Um, there have been schools around the area that have had a similar club and has have been successful. So. We, um, we look to do the same thing. Um, our advisor would be uh, Mr. Wall. Um, he's the football coach here and he's a science teacher. And we have about 20 to 30 kids that are definite that they want to do it. And there's a little bit more kids. But our, our, um, so I think we have a pretty good um, following. And we have a, a good amount of like freshmen. We have about five to 10 that want to do this so they could help carry the club so it just doesn't die out. And um, like the, our main goal is, is like I kind of think of it as like, like with a, a tree or a plant, you have to set the roots down before it can grow. So we need to like get the roots in, and then we just need to be able to expand. Just that, you know, if we get more, we in the future when we start fundraising more money, we can start making more care packages <coughs> and stuff like that. That's all we have. Any questions or sure. comments, Scott? I I, I have two. I mean. You answered most of the questions, and I think it's a great idea, and I think very nice presentation. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, the two questions I just had were, uh, number one, the ages for the club. Is it going to be high school only, or, or are you looking to try to have something for the middle school as well? And then secondly, is there a bank account yet? Because I know for different activities, we've gone through like what you know handling the money, and it's, maybe that's for Mr. Connolly, if, if, whether there's a bank account set up for this organization yet. Yeah, I think I think for the bank account that would be handled. I think the advisor yeah, would, yeah, would, be honest would work with Michael activity. to set that up afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also think on the middle school that would have to be a separate. Would it be a separate club or club. is it correct? I don't think we can have middle school. They, they're Michael and Kyle saying just high school. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I know one thing is is um, I think it'd be, I think it'd be better to be just high school just because I mean I mean I know the middle school we, if we wanted to we could incorporate them but I mean. Just with the care package thing, I just think it just like with the high school, it just it's a little bit more a mature group, so I think they can like get the se like the sense of like a, like a war time zone. I, I mean, I think sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, um, they could help out if if they in the future if they ever wanted to um, do something like that. But it'd probably just be a separate North Vernon High School club. Well, congratulations, great idea. Glad to see you guys came up with it, and I hope you have great participation as well. So. Thanks. Yeah, if I was a teacher, I'd give you guys an A for the, for the quarter. So lucky, lucky I'm not a teacher. It'd be an easy grade. Um, but it's a great idea. It's admirable. Um, I did have one question. Is there some kind of um, state or national or f group that you have to make sure everything is approved that you send to the soldiers? Do you get a list or something? How does that work? So uh, I'm pretty sure they have a list of things that you can send, but um, that wasn't hard for us to find. Okay. So there's other groups that do it. So. And I um I contacted Hanskin Air Force Base. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. Hanskin. Yeah. yeah. And um, um, the public affairs officer. She was a really nice lady. She emailed me back, and she um, she I was, uh, she uh gave me the contact information for um the person that would I'd have to contact, and he hasn't emailed me back yet. I emailed them two days ago. She said he'd be emailing me back in five to seven business days, but um, she said you just if you could just go through him, and then Mr. Down said that he he has the ability to get onto the base. So if if we have to, he can bring them to the um to the base, the care packages, and we could just go through them. And he said that um the base can also help you with like telling you what to put in it and stuff like that, and giving you a list. 
or you can go to the national um, website and it has things of what you should you could put in a care package and stuff like that. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, you can ask a question. The, um, the public affairs officer, the way she, the way um, this is how I interpreted it from what she um, sent me, she said they know that there are soldiers that have families that and whenever the families want to send something to the soldiers, they send it to her and then she helps organize it. So she does know that there are soldiers that are lacking things or some soldiers that don't get things. So she said she can make sure that like we always have a solid list of soldiers that like that are getting something, and then even if we because um, we're a new club, say she says she has 25 soldiers, we can only make like 22 care packages or something like that. She said there are certain soldiers that they'll get something like once or twice a year that they would be the ones that would be like the three day excluded. But she says there are soldiers that are like 18 year old kids that were orphans that just joined up and don't have anyone. So she said that they would be the first priority people. Well, great job, great idea. Um, Great, you guys came up with it. So at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve a Students for Soldiers Club for a two-year trial period, and then after that, if it is successful, it will continue on. Right. Second. Motion by Janine, second by Jerry. Any further discussion? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Great job. Thank you. Kyle, you're gonna get back this season or what? Um, at least for Thanksgiving. You'll be back for Thanksgiving, yeah. all right. You'll be back for third round play. All right, that, that sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have a presentation or no? So can we get back to our regular seats, or do you have a? Uh, no, we can speak from here. No, but I mean, so we can do sit back at our regular seats. You just need a microphone. I'll give you a microphone. You don't, you don't have to stay, but you're welcome. We got a soccer update for you. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're going 10-0. 10-0. Zero. Zero. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, I did, I, no, I just got a via text. Uh, once, once you mentioned that, I checked in and wow. you know, I didn't believe it. You said the soccer team, yeah, the girls soccer team went. Okay, That's a, that was a pretty um, awesome thing to just sit through with those two guys from the high school. I give them a lot of credit, yeah. it's particularly in light of the things that are going on today in the country. Though, exactly. So. Okay, next we have, um, Another, which is becoming an annual presentation for, um, from the North Reading High School Model United Nations. And we have Mr. Satiris Pinsopoulos here and two students, Caitlin Galvin, and a second appearance tonight, guest, a guest star appearance tonight by Michael Terrell. He's and, everywhere. <laughs> and he's unbelievable. And they're gonna talk about a proposal to attend the 2018 Harvard Model United Nations Conference. All right. Um, so thanks for having us here today. Again, my name is Satiti Pinsopoulos. I'm the advisor for the Model United Nations. Uh, we've been a club here at the school for several years now. We've actually gone to this event that we're looking uh, for approval this year, the Harvard Model United Nations Conference. Uh, we've gone in the past, I think this is our fourth or fifth year in a row. Um, and we have a, a pretty big group here. We actually meet in the DLL as often as we can at this point. We're bi-weekly. Uh, we do our debates, discussions in this room. Uh, as of right now, we have about 53 students. We have 53 students in the club. Um, for the Harvard Model United Nations Conference, we would have anywhere from 14 to 16 seats. It all depends on two special applications that were just put in. Both Caitlin and Michael uh, put in a special application for a specific type of committee at this um, conference. They can speak about it in a moment. Um, but on my end, I'm just here to answer questions you guys may have about the conference. Um, it would be an overnight. It would be from Thursday, January 25th through Sunday, January 28th. Um, what we do is we have parents volunteer to drive us, drop us off at the Sheridan Hotel in Boston. The conference takes place at that hotel. So it's run by Harvard but it's held at the Sheridan in Boston. And uh, students are selected of the 53 students in the club, maybe about 30 of them are interested in participating. We go through the debates that we have and we select the 14 to 16 that um, are best fit for it, the people who are showing up every day, putting in a valiant effort. Um, there's a registration fee, there's fees with the hotel. Uh, the way we've always done it in the past, we look at the number of students, we divide up 
the total amount, I total how much the hotel is, what the registration fee is, divided up and distributed amongst the students. Uh, the exact fee is, as of right now, up in the air because it depends on the male to female ratio because of the rooms and the hotels. So do we, need, do we get three quads or two doubles and a triple? It all depends on who we select. But uh, last year, do you remember, give or take, was it three to 400 fee, something like that? Uh, I think it was around uh, in between those two numbers. Yeah, somewhere in there. It, it depends. The hotel fee goes up every year. Uh, but the students pay their way. Um, again, I'm here for any questions you may have. I could speak about the conference uh, endlessly. It's a great opportunity for the students. Uh, actually, the letter that was drafted was by, what's one of you? I'm Molly. Molly, yeah, one of our other um, uh, executive members, uh, Molly Pfeffer, wrote the letter that you guys may have in front of you. We have extra copies if anyone needs, but I figured I'd let Caitlin and Mike speak about their experience because they had gone in the past. They'll, they would like to go again this year, so I'll leave it to them. It's fine. Can you move the microphone over when yeah. this picture? Uh, Thanks. So, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that uh, just logistically, we have usually we'll have under 20 people, so there will be two advisors coming. Uh, uh, Mr. Nosey will be the other advisor. He's also a teacher in the building. And then uh, also logistically, it, it's held in the Sheridan Hotel, and I don't know if any of you know about the Sheridan Hotel. It's connected to the Prudential Center, so students won't have to leave the building to get any food or in case they lose something, they'll be able to stay in the Sheridan uh, pretty much for the whole three, four days uh, without issue. We haven't had any issues in the past. It's an excellent opportunity for the students because, I mean, our next debate, we have a debate amongst each other on Thursday, is on nuclear nonproliferations. You know, students get an idea to look into different perspectives they wouldn't have held uh, in the past, and they get to understand the world from completely different perspectives. They get to see things from a different way. And not only that, but at the actual conference, at the Sheridan, uh, there are kids from all around the world. Uh, last year, there was a delegation of around 30 to 40 kids from Peru, United Kingdom, India. So we get to meet all these new kids. We get to experience uh, all these world events from different perspectives. It's an excellent opportunity for the school to represent itself as a, as a uh, body that, represents, that uh, promotes multiple different ac activities. I mean, all around, we haven't had any issues. It's logistically smooth, and it's an excellent opportunity for the students and for the school. Building off what Mike said, it's a really great opportunity to really go in depth with the topic. Like each student will be kind of either one or two students will be assigned to different topics. Last year I was on the environmental assembly and it, we talked about fracking and it was a topic I had never really investigated a lot, but I've just, now I know so, way more than I'd ever need to about it. But in the process I got to interact with people from New Zealand and Canada that I still talk with on social media and it was just a great experience to really explore something from the point of view of another country like I know I have strong political beliefs but we got to represent Denmark last year and this year we're going to represent Uzbekistan so it's really an awesome experience I have one question is any chance that anybody from our delegation could play the role of Kim Jong-un at the uh, <laughs> oh on Thursday's debate no at the at the uh, United uh, model oh. United Nations you think there'll be a Kim Jong-un session my question is, I don't, they do you think, be in attendance. Do you think they're going to let these kids from around the world come in to the country to attend? I mean, yeah. it's... Yeah, it's totally, it's an excellent for many. There's, there's lots of fun involved in it, but it's also, just to give you a glimpse into the schedule, I don't know if you have any in front of you, we get there Thursday, we have opening ceremonies, we immediately go into a four-hour debate session until 11 o'clock at night. Okay. Then we wake up Friday morning. Oh, two debate sessions. We got a four-hour debate session from like eight or nine to one, lunch, and then you're there from till like... 11 o'clock at night. Go to bed, wake up the next morning. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So it's a really fun conference, but it's also, you know, there's work involved. So this is a, this is a student-driven, work-driven experience that's also a ton of fun at the same time. So it's great. Any other questions? Who did you say you would be representing this year? Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. Where is that? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's one of the stands. It's right next to Kazakhstan. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, Kyrgyzstan. And, Kyrgyzstan. And, all the stands. They used to be part of Russia. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Again, as in the past, I've said this is, I'm sure it's a great conference. The opportunity to mix and exchange views with kids from all over the world, but also the chance to you know, firsthand experience the issues that we're facing in the world, I think is, uh, it's a great, great opportunity that you don't get every day or 
much at all, especially when you're 17 or 18. So I, I think it's great. I'm sure you guys are going to hold your own, too. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> So at this point, I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, the trip by the North Reading High School Model United Nations to the um, Harvard 2018 Harvard Model United Nations Conference, January 25th through the 28th. So moved. Second. Motion by Janine, second by Jerry. Any further comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. What did you say the score of that soccer game was? Girls soccer? 10-0. Ooh, 10-0. I'm assuming we won. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was a misprint. Someone sent me a text. Oh. You mean 1-0? No. Anything on the bo No boys soccer score? Uh, I didn't check. Oh, okay. No. They're, are they away? Yeah, they were at, oh, they're were. playing tonight at Rockport. Okay. So they're I think the game was at 6.30. Yeah, 630. All right, thanks. So you want to bring that up? Yeah, sure. That's always good to uh, get a good flavor of what's going on at the high school. And tonight, we couldn't have got a better flavor. Yeah. Um, did a nice job. Excellent to see students involved in global and local affairs. Passionately involved. Passionately involved, yeah. Mm. It's awesome. Okay, now let's get back to the mundane. The mundane, that's coming <coughs> up soon with the policy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. That's called Beyond Mundane. <laughs> Don't diss the policy <laughs> subcommittee, I'm not Mr. Venezia. Yeah. All right. Okay, so back to uh, continued business. We have the MSBA, MSBC update. Mr. Bernard. Mr. Chairman, thank you. SSBC. So, <clears throat> I think we're, we are coming to a close, I think, with the uh, last SSBC meeting uh, for the present, of, as exclusive of the, of the closeout being on October 24th. But I do have a few things that I wanted to bring to your attention tonight. Um, you might remember that there was some puddling that was occurring outside of the central office around that, that small island. A second drain was, uh, was installed. We're continuing to evaluate the success of that second drain being installed. So, uh, but I do, will have to say um, that the, the contractor that was on site, the Dow Company, has been very good and is trying to resolve that um, that problem. Um, to date, all of the um, re trees and shrubs that were in need of being replaced, um, that work has been completed. I'm awaiting. Uh, Bill Brown, whom some of you know as the uh, lands contracted landscape architect, to come out and verify um, the success of that work. That includes the three trees um, heading over to this part of the school um, on the left-hand side of the bridge coming from the uh, Main Street corridor, as well as I think about 24 smaller shrubs in some of the, um, some of the islands on the, on the front pavilion and out back. Um, you may have noticed that the hydro seeding of the areas that had been uh, remaining uh, in need of, of patch was done on uh, October 4th. That, that grass has started to germinate, which is a good thing. Um, quite honestly, I was impressed with the amount that got done. It, it exceeded what I thought was going to get done, particularly I, on the sloped area alongside the library. So um, again, that was the Dow company that coordinated that, and they, they did a nice job bringing in fresh loam. Um, and also they, down at the uh, athletic fields. I was there's, a, there's about four or five yeah, spots down the there. Lot, down yeah, there. we're going to stake all that out right for the winter. It is right now. I it think is now. It, it was the next day. Okay. Yeah, really, it needed to be, and I'm glad that we did do that, particularly down low. Yeah, um, the plows do a number. Of yeah, well, the, all of the islands we stake, but this right now has caution tape around it, and I think it has helped to. That's the areas that were seeded. Correct. We're talking. We're going to stake out for the winter the entire. We, yeah, we, we do and we will, yeah. yes. All of, the, all of the island berms right. and such, yes. Right. Well, on that seating, are we somehow able to water it? Because down there, It's funny, I had a conversation. it hasn't rained that much at It's all. actually done better down there, <clears throat> but this area and yeah. the area outside of the central office have right. not. So I actually spoke to Wayne about it today. And we're going to have small to area, some water. It is, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's time to do it. It's just we haven't had any rain. So. Right, yeah. it hasn't rained for like the last yeah. two or three weeks. So. And uh, I'm pleased to tell you, too, that the work that... Um, to, to repair or seal the cracks in the asphalt paving was done last night. And they did an extensive amount of work. I don't know if you drove around. I drove around. They did, they did yeah. a lot. Um, they even did the road coming around by the middle school and that. And yeah, they, as well. the, the word was, look, at, we're going to be here for the time, so get us to do as much as you want during that time once we're here and we have all the equipment. And they did. They did a lot. What so. was the cost, John? The cost of the work itself was just under $4,800. Who's paying for it? That's coming out of the uh, building project. They had appropriated um, so that's a, a the not to we, exceed. We agreed to. Correct. They had appropriated a not to exceed amount. We did also have one uh, public works person here for the for the work to kind of oversee it. So 
there'll be a little bit of an additional cost. We, we haven't made up our mind yet how we're going to proceed on this, right? right as far as uh, Gilbane. We have not. I can tell you that there have been two communications to Gilbane from the town administrator indicating to them that, you know, if you want to come out here and assess it for yourself and take the pictures that you want because the town is leaving its, its options open, open on how we pursue that. So that's been clearly communicated in writing. And just so it's clear to the public, uh, Gilbane basically, I mean, they said that the warranty has expired, um, the job was done correctly, and it's now your responsibility. That, in, in a nutshell, I think is what their answer was, correct? I think that's about yeah, I mean, I, I sums don't, it up. I think the warranty has expired. Right. The question is whether the workmanship was right. um, you know, up to standard, really. Exactly. And, and to extend that a little bit, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, just the reason, again, for the public, the reason we felt the need to do this now was because before the winter when if water gets in, freezes, expands, the crew, so we, we did this more of a preventative maintenance, but um, I think it was, I think it was the, the prudent thing to do, and we'll see you know, what, what tack the SSBC and the town want to take beyond, uh, beyond what was done last night. So. Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Bernard, if I could at this time, I think it's a good place for me to provide an update on what's going on down at the uh, uh, thrift field, uh, the concession yeah. stand, sure. and the um, uh, new restroom building. Um, today, uh, or last week, the uh, contractor received the shop drawings from the um, company that is constructing the building in Connecticut. Right. And um, the concession stand was demolished last week. It's gone. Maybe even been the week before, actually. I think it was midweek the week before. Yeah. We have uh, the Department of, Department of Environmental Protection from the state DEP approval to tie into the wastewater treatment plant. Correct. And I believe, or I hope, that we'll be seeing work soon on the uh, site now that they have the, the drawings. The, the plan was to have this completed, this first, um, uh, first part of the project by mid-November. And then January, February sometime to have the, the building is, is right. prefab building, to have it brought in. All the fixtures are, are, are attached, everything is there. Um, they bring it in, they put it down on the site, and they basically connect everything. That's, um, there were some minor changes. Um, I think it was a, a, a slightly bigger water tank. It is. 30 yeah. gallon water tank. Correct. <clears throat> a, a, a change in the location of the, um, where the electrical yep. uh, box the was gonna be. Is, yep. <clears throat> I think that's it. I think no, too, we're trying to decide on what we're going to do with that facade. I think we decided. That, um, I think we're I moving think forward. We, I think we heard what the group wanted right. and we're asking okay. them to include. We're going to include that, right? Yeah. 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 That came through about two, two or three hours ago. I think we have to pick the color. We do. Right? Right. On the brick. We're, we're going to go with the brick facade. Right? Yeah, we have to, there's different yes. color brick. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You I, think, pick I right. think we sensed that that's what the group wanted us to pursue. <clears throat> yeah. I think it's going to look very similar to that sim sample, right? I think right. that sample that they left for me is exactly. what we would like to try to match. So. so that's moving along. We still have a completion date of March 15th. Wouldn't be 100% complete till April Correct. sometime when they can get the, pave, uh, get the um, pavement plants open and right. hot top plants and pave around the area. But I did notice that um, I, I was at the football game Friday night, and it seemed like they were still doing a good business at the concession stand yeah. where it's located. It's a great central location right next to the... Uh, team room building between the team room and it's a little crowded I will mm -hmm. say um, but between the team room and the grandstands so um, the music boosters I think have done a very good job of dealing with a little bit of adversity I mean I think they really they understood what we were up against and what, what it meant for them and they've really I think done about the best they could to mm -hmm. to, to, to accommodate I think what you have to do in all construction projects you know and there has they, to be and, some uh, and I haven't heard a complaint. You get, a, you know, no you know and I checked in with them on on Friday night and they seemed pleased you know they, they they were they were doing a nice job of, of grinning and bearing it so they know they're, they're trying to look at the right, look long term benefit forward uh, it's looking, good right. it's nice to see that they are and the good news for them is it's highly likely we get a uh, home playoff game yes uh, well we have thanksgiving at home this year too right yeah, thanks oh, we, will, we, we will have a home playoff game. Yeah. right yeah we will so. host at least a game yeah anyway and right we have thanksgiving this year right. too so right okay any questions on the uh, building project update the last, the last official schedule meeting for the SSBC is next Tuesday. Right. There likely will be a meeting or two somewhere down the road when the project finally closes out with the MSBA. Right. But at this time, I don't think there'll be any more meetings scheduled after um, next Tuesday. October for, 24th. So right. What are we supposed to do on Tuesdays? I don't know. <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to stay Policy home and have dinner with your wife. Jo join a subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
it at 7 a.m. now. Okay, yeah. we've gone through all the proposals. Um, next, we have um, appointing representatives to the newly created subcommittees, the Budget and Finance Subcommittee and the Contract Review Subcommittee. Uh, before we do that, I, I, the one thing I wonder is, do we have to have a specific charge, or shouldn't we have a specific charge of each committee so we know um, exactly what the two representatives are going to be doing and, and what they'll be reporting back to um, the committee? I'm throwing that out to the committee here. It seems to make sense. Uh, Jerry? Yeah, I, I would say what I would anticipate doing is trying to review the foundation budget. Um, the existing budget and try to go through it and see what's already there so that maybe there's some, um, you know, there's some things that we could prioritize that we need more than what's already there. But just to see the, how the budget's built from the, from the ground up, basically. Um, and then also to make a determination, I know you brought this up before, Mel, as to whether or not uh, what level of participation we may want them to have in the budget discussions amongst the administrative team as well. If, you know, if we're going to do that or if we're just going to maybe have John, summarize for them what's going on with the administration. Yeah, I have, I, have, I have two minds. I have two minds of a lot of things. But on that, I have uh, two minds. I, it would be interesting. It would be, it could be really good to have committee members at those admin team meetings. But then I wonder if that might um, be a little bit, um, I don't know. Might alter the discussion. <laughs> yes. Well, a middle ground might be for John to come back and basically just kind of re report our, our uh, that 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 is what I was thinking. That so the subcommittee keep, keep meets the with John, up to date. <clears throat> and then you know John and Mike. I say John and Michael meet with the subcommittee, or John, Michael, and Patrick. Keep them up to date on and it. they say, here's what based on our, our meetings of the last few weeks, here's what we think the priorities are. And then our subcommittee could say, that sounds good, but you know the last five years in the school committee, we've really been pushing for X. We think that's a priority too. And without so, being too ambitious, I do think again, if the subcommittee could look at the budget line for line item by line, I, I agree with that what's there and what, what, you know, whether or not there's any, any type of uh, opportunity to maybe um, reduce the cost in a certain line. You know? Since I don't intend to volunteer, I think as much work as we can give the subcommittee. No, I, I think. I think you should worry. be on this subcommittee. I, I intend to nominate you, so. <laughs> I, do, I do think, um, I spent a lot of time on the, on the budget today for another reason, but I do think to get a good idea of each line item how much is it either increased or decreased over the last three years or so, and and to see um, what areas that we think are underfunded, I think that's that's, that's a great idea. But I, I don't, John, you chime in. I don't really see the subcommittee attending those admin council meetings. I think it might. Oh, and I'm fine with that. If the, you know, if you if you're comfortable with us kind of bringing back to you yeah, information as, you know, kind of almost a liaison type capacity, right. try that at least and see. So bef before you and Michael come, or Michael come with the first budget, you'll have, you'll have gotten input from right. whoever's on whoever's that, that subcommittee. I was going to say Scott and Julie, but I don't mean, no, who's ever on that committee, yeah. you'll have gotten input before that budget comes. So I, I think that. I think I would like to hear from department heads. So I don't know if that would, that might be not part of the administrative council meeting perhaps we could invite them to a subcommittee meeting just to explain their requests that's actually that's I've actually talked a better idea. to people in other communities i know burlington does it um, where they do this type of thing they have department heads come they have principals come and talk to school committee members so that would be separate from obviously john and michael meeting with the administrators right. then they would come maybe individually I think that I think that's actually a good idea they can come and well kind of like how we do at CIPC right you know, like the, the department heads come to us and they explain why they need they could come and lay out their priorities uh, so we'd have a better understanding well, we could of that. do that at a subcommittee level rather than an open meeting yeah even though it's an open meeting but I yeah but I, I would so that would be separate from the meetings right. that John and John Michael yeah. uh, that I if, if it could sure, be scheduled maybe. So then it gives it's them still a layer of insulation right. between, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You and also they can come and they can, you know, passionately say why they right. Right. feel yeah. they right. need what they need. Well, to, to, I think that's good. To go back to your, the question that brought us down this path, though, about <clears throat> what should the marching orders be, I would expect in the beginning they'd be fairly loose so that yeah. we can see what happens because I think if if we get a lot of the information we're looking for from Mr. Bernard, then maybe we don't need to do other things. If we, I think we should. I think. 
whoever's on the policy subcommittee should have a little latitude to try different things and see what information you're getting because maybe you get the information and you have long meetings and then you find out, well, we got a lot of that same information another way. So I would say having some broad marching orders to begin, but I think when we're starting a committee, it would be nice to have whoever's on there and have a little bit of latitude about. I think, I think that's right. And I also think, um, obviously, Michael should be part of it. So it would be you, Michael, and two school committee members. That, that's what I was thinking you would, you would want. Right, and then, and then I would think, I think Scott's right. You kind of have these uh, loose boundaries, but then as you meet, have your first two meetings, you can define more exactly. See what you might want right. for future meetings. Right, what, how you want the thing to take shape. And of course, like looking at the strategic plan and what that is laying out for the coming school year right. and right. You know, what yeah. that entails. Yeah. So. But then the question is, should the should the subcommittee, should we appoint somebody and that let them come up with some ideas on what the goal should be that comes back to the committee or should we try to create what those goals are today? I don't, I don't really think you need goals as, more, as much as you need, I, I, I guess you could call it a goal, but it's guidelines. What, what, what do you want to bring back to the committee before we, you know, for when we hear the budget? So that first night when, when um, Michael presents the preliminary budget. Whoever's on that subcommittee right. says, right. you know, we met with um, Michael and John and Patrick and we agreed with X, but to be honest, we think a higher priority might be Y. And then that's for us to discuss. And we, we've done that in the past, but we haven't had as much information. Not that Michael and John are, you know, feeding us false information, but at least we have, you know, you guys have been directly involved, whoever is on it. You guys, me guy, we guys. <laughs> Us gals. Every year we come out the preliminary budget too. There's always things that John is looking for to mm -hmm. try to, you know, enhance the curriculum or reduce class size or whatever it might be. And oftentimes we sit there, we look at it, and it might be a fairly nominal amount of money compared to the overall budget, and we don't do it because, you know, apparently it's not enough of a priority over the other twenty six million dollars worth of things that we're doing. So that's one of the things I'd like to take a look at to see if some of these new initiatives should basically take priority over maybe something that's already embedded Existing. in the budget. Right. You know? One thing I know is 80-plus um, percent of our budget is personnel, yeah. and for the foreseeable future, that's not going down. Um, right. And so there's just, there's just the, and then the, the, you know, the rest of it, there's just so much to really work with. It's, it's, it's really a small percentage of the budget. It was funny. We were working on a little spreadsheet today as preparation for early budget planning process and on the expense side of the equation just very quickly we came up with you know 80 almost 85 or percent of our expenses as sort of fixed contractual things that we're obligated to do with utilities and transportation right so that's 85 of 20 percent so that leaves basically three percent no that's 85 percent of the whole budget he's saying no no that's 85 percent of, of what we 85 percent of the expense of the expense of oh. 85 percent of the remaining 17 percent so, so those are those so are non-negotiable that 85 percent. it's right. almost like yeah they're fixed with so it leaves you about two and a half percent yeah right two and a half yeah. percent of what else you still i mean it's, have. It's, you know it's, it's yeah. a little less than a million dollars that's you know we we know as a committee as administrators as a community we're understaffed at the high school and for the next two years or more we're going to still have close to 800 students there it's not it's not plummeting right um, we know we have a lot more kindergarten students this year than we expected, and that could have an impact when they go into the first grade next year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know we've been trying to expand the uh, foreign language, language program for many years and failed. So, so we know what those priorities are, I think. And, and as Jerry said, I know it's hard to take something out that's already there, but may maybe that's one thing that this subcommittee can do, is, as Jerry said, look at those things. Maybe. You know, we can increase foreign language if we remove Y, but it's not, it's never easy to remove Y. I spent a great deal of time on Facebook this week up, um, going over the free, over the full day kindergarten again and, and explaining why we can't have free full day K, that we would need between five and $700,000 somewhere yep. in the budget, mm -hmm. and we don't have that extra money. That would mean cutting five to seven hundred thousand dollars right. somewhere else and so i had this discussion with mike before the meeting i was asking his yeah. daughter just started kindergarten and they're paying 40 it's higher in reading 600 in reading not that you know we're proud not of that we're trying yeah. right and and um they surpassed us yeah. They did, yeah. yeah and you know the question keeps coming up about state grants and because of north reading's per capita income 
and per family income, it's highly unlikely we're ever gonna get a state grant for this. And Michael's on top of that. And also in terms of additional chapter 70, if we added full free day K, we'd get $25 per student. Correct. And that's gonna be about $4,000 or something or $5,000. That's not gonna cover the 500 to $700,000. But it's issues like that. It's issues like fees or questions today about um, on, on social media again, why doesn't the maskers, why do the, why do the maskers have to raise so much money for their, um, for their plays, for their performances? Don't they pay the students? Don't, they, don't the students pay the $200 um, activities fee? So I had to explain. A student pays $200. First I said I, I despise fees, but I've come to realize without them, we wouldn't have but these you're programs. you're responsible for a lot of them. Yeah, exa oh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> but it, I explained that a student pays $200, can be in as many clubs as they would like, both middle school and high school. And that $200 covers, there's $116,000 in advisor salaries for this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. We cover that with 67,000 from fees yep. and the rest comes from the budget. And, and honestly, some of those advisor fees are fairly modest, right? For the a lot of them are. They do. Yeah, yeah a lot of them are. They do. a lot that are, yeah. It's the same thing with, and then someone, of course, chimed in, and, and what about these athletic fees? How can they justify charging them? And so I posted the athletic budget is close to $650,000. We cover it. We take $270,000 from fees, $25,000 from expected gate receipts, yep. and the rest comes from the budget. So if you cut that money out, that's $340,000 approximately you're cutting out of fees. Either the programs disappear or they become, you have five it, clubs and two our sports. Our philosophy's been for a long time that if we can't afford it, we want to give the community the opportunity right. to make a decision of, as to whether or not they want to have it. And if they want to have it, they're going to have to pay the fees. Right. Otherwise, Otherwise, we're going to have to get it. We can't afford it. But I think those are things that a, a budget committee can look at. They can look at fees. Is there any possibility of cutting fees? I don't think there is. Um, you know, I, I don't have as big a problem with the bus fee because the fee we charge for busing is for those who are older than sixth grade and who live within, um, oh, people who live out, uh, outside two the two mile, inside the two mile district if they're between first K and, and if five. If they live right? outside the two mile district. No, if they live inside, they get charged. Right, if they're right. outside, they're free. Right, they're outside, it's free, yeah. Well, not after. Not after grade six, right. So all of this said, who has an interest in this subcommittee? No, I don't. I think you have a great start. On <laughs> I think Julie would be a key person. Well, on, well on part it. part of me was thinking. Which part? <laughs> depending on who might be interested in the next subcommittee. Well, I had an idea for someone on the next subcommittee, Mr. Lawyer at the end of the table. Well, he's already started. Yeah, he's already started doing work on that right. one anyway. So. Yeah, I think. I, I think it would make some sense for. Honestly, for yeah. Mel being a part of the finance planning team, at least for this. Oh, on the budget thing? Yeah, to be on the budget. Well, that's, I mean, I, I liked, I personally liked the idea of having a teacher, you know, somebody with that background, and then somebody from the, who's okay. going to be doing the, going to the financial planning meetings. So you, being involved are you interested? Well. Well, I can do that. Okay. But, but at the same time, I mean, I'm, I have interest in the budget overall, and so, but I'm not in the financial planning team meetings, and I'm not, so I think, I don't know. I mean, I don't know with the financial planning team meeting, would it, would it help you to be part of that, Mel, if you were going yes. to the financial plan I to be so. part of the budget subcommittee? And I that's, think so. And that's the thing. I mean, what, what I was assuming who, uh, it would be good to have at least one representative of the subcommittee fact, that's I, I going to be going to financial planning. Because the financial planning team is at a certain stage, at a certain time of the year, it becomes 90% right. discussion. Right. <laughs> So anybody that's on this budget subcommittee is going to have that much more information. Yeah. You'll have you'll you'll be in those rooms job. to hear from the people directly and not you know, you'll be able right. to pull more like well when somebody tries right. to question you'll, something. You'll be able to give better answers. answers. Right. Yeah, and, and and also point out like when they're criticizing one thing in the budget, you can bring up five different things that didn't even make it to them that are also worthy, you know. And that always falls on John's shoulders, which is okay. But I think it'd be better if there's two or three people who can I'll fire be happy back. To share that yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think hearing the request yes. has some merit to it. Yeah. 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 Directly. So, there's yeah. Things that get requested yeah. that then get prioritized. Yeah. So I, I do personally have interest in the budget, but I think for the committee, I think somebody that's going to be going to financial planning should be there. And I like the idea of a teacher hearing from some of the administrators about some of the needs as well. Well, who's a teacher on the committee? <laughs> so. Um, 
It's up to you, Scott. I mean, I. Yeah. Well, but the if other. If not, thing I, I would be interested in the contract stuff. So I mean, what? You can be on both of them. No thanks. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> come I on. Was, what kind of attitude is that? <laughs> I was interested in the contract one, so I was thinking. Okay. That. All right. So if, if. That's fine. But again, I I had interest in both of them. So I mean, whatever the committee thinks. Janine, J Jerry probably isn't volunteering on the contract one, are you? Uh, I'll do it if nobody else wants to do it. I've looked at some of the stuff that Scott's done, and you know, it's um, and we are doing the negotiations for the teacher contract. I don't want to leave Janine out though. Janine can step in. Yeah, if you want to do it, Janine. Huh? I thought you said yeah. boohoo. <laughs> are you interested in the contract review? I mean, not. I mean, I know you're Scott interested, but. Oh uh, well. I, where I am interested, I think it would make more sense to have Jerry because he's done so many of the contracts. And he's that, on the teacher contract. And he's on the yeah. teacher okay. contract. So. I mean, that would also be nice to sort of be able to get some of the knowledge from the uh, experienced people on the committee. That only take about 15 minutes. <laughs> and so. <laughs> 15, you're giving yourself okay, a lot so of yes, credit. I'm interested in the budget and finance subcommittee. <laughs> okay. I, I, I guess I am also. And so. Right. so I mean, I we would, need nominations can we, we can, can we, we do it at can we do two at a time I yeah see why not. all right so i'll make a motion to nominate mel webster and julie Koki for the um, budget and finance subcommittee representatives second, second. okay you go ahead. Let's go. <laughs> any further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. opposed unanimous and now for the contract review subcommittee representatives Make a motion to recommend Jerry Venencia and Scott Buckley for the contract review subcommittee representative. Yeah, I say again, if Janine wants to do that, mm. it's okay with me. You, know? you have the history. It makes more sense. <laughs> I mean, if you were adamantly you didn't want to do it, I would definitely no, take it over. It. But I just think it. it makes more sense right. to have you do right. it. The only problem about this is now there's going to be a lot of paper because I can't email anything back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> no, with my. We need member. a second on this. As a senior member, am I in charge second. of him? Okay, second. Yeah, you're in charge. Yeah, <laughs> you can tell him what to do. Right. On email, all email me all your commands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a motion. Respond right away. <laughs> we have a motion by Janine and a second by Julie. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Mr. Hey, Chairman, just on the first committee, would do you want? us to maybe reach out to the two of you when we think the time is right yeah I feel like we have the information we'll yeah. initiate that first meeting okay yeah yeah okay we're actually going to have a preliminary discussion with all of the administrators on Thursday okay so we're kicking it off you know sooner right. than you might think so it won't be probably very long before we're looking to okay. bring people together on that you're right, right. Yeah. Yeah, like coming so, quickly yeah. so okay next we have the official uh, enrollment for 2017 2018 mr. Bernard or Michael whoever's handling it yeah, mr. chairman thank you I think both Michael and I we so we're sharing with you what is traditionally referred to as the October 1 enrollment it happened to be that October 1 was a Sunday so this is labeled October 2 but this is our um, counts as of um, as of that date broken out by by either grade um, and school or just school in the case of the middle school and the high school we anticipate going forward with um, a more detailed presentation on projections of enrollment um, it could be as early as the next meeting which would be october 30th if not november 13th definitely but right, yeah. i think michael's looking to do that with you on the on the 30th but um, i think this is you know this is pretty self-explanatory where our, our enrollment is um, is almost exactly what it was for the past school year i think we're off by about five students um, I don't think there's anything that's dramatically, um, you know, anything that poses any kind of a surprise for you here. Yeah, I think the two biggest things where maybe the projections were off from a year ago, we talked a little bit about at the last meeting was we saw an uptick in the kindergarten um, this year. I think that's evidence of just, you know, an incoming of, of you know, new families with uh, you know, school age children over the last five years. Um, since the, the birth rates five years ago. Um, so that number was, was higher than what we had thought about a year ago by you know, you know, 25 or so students, which we uh, discovered during the budget process. And then what we also did see is that, that sixth grade enrollment was a little bit higher than what um, we had projected. So I think we, we didn't really lose uh, many students at all from fifth to sixth this past year. It was you know, less, almost less than 1%, one and you know, one and a half percent. Um, so I think that was, you know, we had projected kindergarten to be lower and 
overall middle school to be a little bit lower. I know it's, everything else was very close to being. Yes, yeah, so I, I know you're going to do a full projection, but you, we had projected 46 fewer students this year, and we ended up with six fewer. I think next year we're projecting another 40 to 50 yeah, fewer students. Right. And, and I, just, I just don't know if I believe that now based on, no, everything on what I'm different. seeing here. Every, yeah. yeah, that's why you redo it every year. Okay. So, uh, everything um, changes on the new, the new data. and uh, So I think when you see the, the, the next year's and then the three and five, ten year projections out, one of the things you'll, you'll notice that's drastically different than a year ago is you're not going to see the, the declines that you may have been seeing, be, be seeing last year, you know, three, three years out or five <coughs> years out. Um, you, know, you really, what you'll see uh, probably on October 30th is, you know, maybe uh, you know, the middle school kind of leveling off um, and even, even increasing and kind of leveling off around 550. You'll see the high school um, kind of the largest decrease happening potentially next year, and then sort of leveling off in that 715, you know, range or so for a period of time. And overall enrollment kind of hovering around 2400 over the next three to five years. That's that's kind of what we're seeing. And I've had meetings with um, over the last couple of weeks with um, Daniel McKnight, the, the town planner, and, and so forth, and trying to look at what else is on the horizon in terms of developments that could bring some. Some increase in, in, in enrollment. And there's nothing in the immediate future that looks like we're going to see a drastic change, but there is some things that are that are going on. There's some age 55 and over developments that will be coming online. So even though you won't see a lot of um, potential families, it's something could be could be able to, a little bit of an impact. But um, you have those, for example, over over by the little school, you have eight or nine houses going nine, in there. Yeah. <laughs> so if they have two kids per family, right? You, you don't know. They could have more. You yeah. could be talking 15 to 20 more kids just at the little school. I mean, you don't know, right? Yeah. But, and I'm assuming those are going to be pretty big houses. They're not going to build, mm -hmm. you know, ranches or anything. Yeah. So. so I think what you're seeing, what you, I think the new trend will sort of be things that's kind of leveling off, um, and we'll have to see what, what happens in those developments. And, but you, you're definitely seeing a, an increase in, you know, the, the economy and the real estate market and some new homes are being, being built and the turnover of houses is increasing a little bit. Um, but there's a still there's a relatively high senior population in some of the demographic data I've looked at. So you could start to um, think that some of those the turnover of, of homes could increase <coughs> in the next five years, and that might impact some of the members. And those are the things you'll have to. It's kind of speculative, watch, really. But it's, yeah, it it's is speculative. It's, it's hard. It's hard to uh, yeah. to nail it down. But for the most part, I think the the process we go through when we develop the the ratios of progression of students from grade to grade, because it has been relatively stable for the last five or ten, I think you can you can kind of rely on what's happened in the past will continue to happen. You just need to kind of look at um, some of, some of the numbers. But um, it was surprising though to have 40 more students this year than we expected. I think. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> I think the, I think I think the I think the kindergarten being about 25 off in the the sixth grade was like 10 off. I think that's that's that accounted for it right there. So it was a couple, a couple areas. We've, we've reduced our factor too with the grade nine. We did. Yeah. We did. Scott. Well, I, I just have a, a question about, and I know you can't control everything, and kids might move, but just how the disparity in some of the classes, where you know it might be 19 in one and 15 in another, and in particular, there's, if you include the hood, kindergarten with the full and the, and the a.m. in the morning, there's there's four classes on here that have 23. And in three of those four, there's another class that could have had another child so that we weren't at that 23 number. And so can you speak a little bit about, like, if there's, like, for example, the hood grade three. Well, that's, there's 23 that's in one, 22 in one, and 18 in another. It seemed like it could have been divided a little bit more so that you didn't have 23 that. kids in that. And just didn't know how that ends up happening. I, I think I one, one issue is special education students with special needs okay. and what their accommodations might be. Okay. That's large, going to be a significant factor. Okay. I think why they might be. But Scott, I, I, I can't believe you brought that up because I was just going to suggest that the administration deserves a lot of credit, and parents ought to be delighted at the class size in the elementary school. You know, out of 46 classes, grades one through five, um, 43 of them have eight. I'm sorry, 22 or fewer students. So, I, I think that if you look at that overall, that is the one area you saw the 22, 23, 18. But other than that, I mean. 
I'd say the kid, the kindergarten, you'd like to be a little, uh, a little, a little lighter, lower but we're trying to accommodate those. everybody, yeah, too. Right, but I do think those ones at the hood are hybrid classes, right, John? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So but even, like, instead of saying seven and four, six and five, it, it, again, it's a minor point, and it could have been a couple kids were going to be in there and didn't end up going to full, going there. And, but the, yeah. the class sizes are really, I mean, I, I think, no, you I know, agree. at the little school, you have 23 and 21 in the first grade, and the others, you have 17. But, again, that's a product of... Uh, demographics is right. You're not going to have three classes of 44. And then it oh. flip flops once you oh. once yeah. you get lower. But right. those numbers yeah. overall, if you look at them, are unbelievable. I mean, our, our goal is to keep you know uh, elementary school classes at what 22 or below. Correct. And we've certainly done that here almost across the board. So. The highest class size we have is 123 at the hood in the third grade. Well, we have 23 at the at the hood in the third. We have bachelor. 23 at the bachelor oh, right. in the third, and we have 23 in there's the first th grade at the little. There's three 23, and then that one but kindergarten is 23 yeah. in the morning. That's it. So, it's it's really, yeah, really a good job, I think, of you know. What number do we get to that we say we need to add another section? Hmm. You know, I haven't had to. To do that yet, we were we were getting nervous as the summer went on say it's, with the it's kindergarten. It's 21 to 52. Oh you yeah, from but I think 25, 26 yeah. to 17, 18. Yeah. That's, I don't yeah. know if you can do much. So I'd say 25. That would be that would be my guess is that if we got to 20, I would be you know having that conversation with you know the chairman. Yeah. But we we thought we were approaching that in the yeah, summer with yeah. with the kindergarten, but we 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 just we didn't, and it was getting very close though. But I think that yeah, once we start to hit 25, definitely 26, I think would be something we would not be very happy about. Well, we've, we've evolved from not being able to accommodate everybody for a full day kindergarten to doing a lottery and now to getting accommodating everybody, so. Yeah, everybody who wanted full day right. kindergarten so again got it, yes. In their home district, right? Uh, right now. Yes. Which is unless, unless they, opt if someone opts not to, correct. right, they right. can go to another school right. if they don't want to be in the hybrid class or, or whatever. I don't think we had a case of that. No, though. I we really were close don't. to it. Yeah, we were yeah, close. We, were, we almost had to get there. Well, I was looking back at, you know, I don't know, it might have been 10, 11 years ago, we had many elementary school classrooms that were 29, 30, and 31 back then. Um, I was actually talking to Marcy Bailey about it because her ago. son was in, yeah. it was a fifth grade class at the batch that had like one of them, yeah. 31 or 32 kids. So yeah. You're talking 10, 11 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. thankfully we've gotten away from that. That was not good. Any other questions on enrollment for this year? We don't need to take a vote here, correct? I don't think so, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Next, as Jerry said, um, the real the real mundane. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen policy revisions from the early bird policy subcommittee. Who's on that? You? The seven a.m. meeting policy subcommittee. Mel's just going to bed. <laughs> About two hours early. I've just. So I don't know who wants to take the lead. Scott, Janine. I, I don't care. Do you want to do what I mean? I did it the first time. You can go on. <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if I offer just an, an introduction? Of course. Go ahead. So just for maybe for the committee's benefit. So we have been meeting. Um, we are scheduled to meet again on Wednesday. Ms. Imbriano, Mr. Buckley, and I, we're looking at, I think we're in the area of about 100 policies, correct, that MASC had recommended be reviewed. Um, and, and some minor changes and some more significant and some that I think you felt there was a need for no change. But inherent, so this is the first chunk of about 10 or 11, I think. There'll be, this, so this is probably gonna happen now for a few meetings, Mr. Chairman, that we'll be bringing a group together. But the, in this group, there are a number that also, um, I think we're gonna be recommending that there be policies repealed, correct, with the replacements three or four, mm -hmm. I think so. Those, mm -hmm. those should be attached to those respective policies in the packet. But I think it's fair to say that what's, what's here is largely reflective of what MASC was recommended, although not exclusively. Okay. Correct. Yeah, and, and, and uh, just to follow up on that, I mean, I think I'd like to applaud Mr. Bernard and the people helping Mr. Bernard because they really did most of this work because our, our labels do not correspond with MASC. <laughs> so it's not like if MASC says, we recommend this change to this policy. Oh, you mean their lettering doesn't correspond no. to our lettering? No. Mm -hmm. So, so we had to go search for policies that fit the spirit of what the policy of the MASC was. But and it's good. We're, so that was we're, that we're, was the that was the hard work. Which was it, Ann that did it? It was Ann. Ann helped me with that. Yes. And you know, Ann and Mr. Bernard did a great job delivering packets to us and saying, 
here's the MASC policy that's being recommended, here's the closest we could find. Um, and what we would do is we would look and sometimes we would say we liked our policy better, other times we would just incorporate a piece of it, and other times we would just say their policy is just overall better and we should repeal ours and put it in place. So or trying to remember. they yeah. combine two. Correct. And Correct. so we just <clears throat> rename it and get right. rid of the other one. Correct. And so, so I'll try to walk through this quickly with, without reading them all before the Mr. Chairman asked me to read every word of them. Um, I am not going to ask you to read <laughs> What, if you can explain, give us, give us an overview of um, what the changes either mean or why they were done. What we're just, what we're doing is, in many cases, we're implementing the recommendations of MASC, correct? Correct. Okay. Oh, it, when I looked through these today before we came here, I think all of these, n none of them were substantive. They're, they were just clarifying language. There might have been updates to law or terminology that might need to happen or there occasionally there was a policy that we might not have had mm -hmm. and so so generally like for example if we start with ABB and I don't know do you want to try to do motions on each of these individually I think we have to yes yes okay. we do right. for first, uh, what time first reading so and so <laughs> I'll take my time now um, so policy ABB the school committee powers and duties we are proposing this in in lieu of what we used to have as BBBA um, and again, it, it, it follows the same language and it just is updated recommendations from MASC and you know, the legal references as well. And so it just talks about the general duties in, of the school committee as a whole. And I don't know if do we, I, had, I had one question. Yeah. It, it says um, in the opening paragraph that um, these include the responsibility and the right to determine policies and practices and to employ a staff. To so can we, that means we can hire people? Is that what they're saying? Or is, is the staff the teachers and administrators? And that's, I just find that strange wording. That, that's all, I don't, uh, maybe, maybe, I guess probably in bigger communities, they have a staff. Like I bet Boston School Committee, I bet Worcester, Lawrence. So we get Lawrence. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Only if you're part well, of I mean, staff. <laughs> but see, that was, a, I was gonna get to, we could hire a staff, but we don't get paid, so I don't really. But anyway, I just. I mean, uh, again, this was the, in general, we tried, if we were going to fully implement the MASC, we tried not to nitpick on, mm -hmm. the, on the language because what wasn't clear in what they gave to us is why they were making all the different changes. They would just say updated, updated legal, like, like the law has changed or something, and we didn't know exactly why the language was proposed as it was. There's something, there is something else interesting in here. Um, I, under the um, last bullet on the first page, the school committee shall appoint upon the recommendation of the superintendent. And one of the positions in there is the, um, is the special education administrator, which we don't have. We have a pupil personnel. But we have in the past I've always argued this. have been involved in that hiring, correct? Yeah. Well, it, it was a Well, it says you, you appoint upon the recommendation of the superintendent. Yeah. Right. But in the past, I think we were involved in it. Were we involved in the interviews of that? Because I thought I think the statute at that time read. I had this big with Kathy Willis. Yeah, I remember. She and I went around and around. When we hired, um, when when Cynthia was hired, yeah. right? Yeah. But we, I think, you were satisfied with that process when we right. Well, would right. We, we based it on the recommendation of the superintendent. Yes. But I'm just wondering if that That's if the situation the had changed. Correct. Okay. I believe it is the director of people personnel services, and and director of finance. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. right. And that was on a recommendation of Kathy, too. And I might say a very good recommendation. Because I remember um, interviewing Michael and wondering if he was old enough to drink at the time. <laughs> <laughs> drink alcoholic beverages, that is. Um, the rest of this looks fine with me. I mean, the only thing I'd object to is working harmoniously with other school committee members. But <laughs> other than that. Um, we're we're uh, trying to plan for the future. So <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Forward thinking. Um, so I guess, and, and Mr. Bernard, just to clarify, so that we had an ABB already in place correct so right. we are We've, modifying the AB, it would, ABB right it would be a motion for to approve for first reading a revised policy ABB is what we'd be looking for okay so I move right move for first reading right no to approve to first approve. reading okay. of um, revised policy ABB um, school district organization school committee powers and duties 
Okay, I'll try this again. We, so I move to approve for first reading. Revised policy. Revised policy. Revised policy, ABB, which is titled School Committee Powers and Duties under School District Organization. Second. Any further discussion? Now we can go faster on the rest of these. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? You Unanimous? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now. No, it's, well, we have no, to, no, we have no, to no, approve that. Now. It's a, yeah. Oh, it's going to be refilled as. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, hang on one second. Okay, and so. Uh, so BBBA is now null and void. But you have to move. Do we have to move to repeal it? You have to move. Yes. To yeah. So it, it, it would now be null and void. So our recommendation was to repeal this one. So I move to, I move to approve. Do I have to do a first reading on this? To, if we're no, repealing? just repealing it. Okay, so I just move to repeal uh, policy BBBA, entitled Duties and Functions of the School Committee under School Committee Operations. Second. For the discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. So this next one, school committee member, members' qualifications and oath of office. Um, this is something that I, well, I won't make jokes about <laughs> people not being in compliance, but um, <laughs> we, this is just updated language from MASC on the obligations we all have to, you know, do the conflict of interest law every two years and uh, the qualification, the, the orientation we have to take when we get elected. So I will move to approve for a first reading revised policy ABCB entitled, now entitled school committee members, school committee member qualifications slash oath of office under the school district organization section. Second. For the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. So next, I, again, this is just, uh, do, 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 you want, do you want clarification? How about this? I'll clarify if it's not just trying to comply with MASC's recommendations. So okay. I move, I move to approve for uh, first reading, revised policy BBBB, entitled New School Committee Member Orientation under the section school committee operations. Oh, second. <laughs> now, just toast off for a second. on this one, I just want to make sure, we, like, because we had put some stuff in here that we wanted to. And I think we thought it was captured on the back of the first. That's, I didn't see the back, okay. Or half halfway down. Saving paper, I see. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm fine with this. Any other? You have a motion and a second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I was waiting for you. I was disappointed. There's no BAB. Oh. I thought you'd be quicker with that one. I know. There's I no BAB. There's BAB. Yeah, Vicky Bible. Vicky Bible. I. I move to approve a first reading of revised policy BBBC entitled School Committee Conferences, Conventions, and Workshops under the section School Committee Operations. Second. I don't have any issues with this one. Basically says that if we find conferences that we feel would be educational and improve our standing on the committee and our understanding of education and education laws that I basically we can propose going to it and if it passes muster get reimbursed it's basically what this says so so we have a, a, a motion and a second any further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. opposed unanimous no <laughs> I know in our goal setting we we were all very adamant about trying to do yeah. some uh, extra PD. education. So uh, next, I move to approve a first reading of revised policy BBD, which is entitled School Committee 
dash superintendent relationship under the school committee operation section. Okay, so the, I was gonna say the, second. So we are repealing one on the next. Yes. The old one yeah, on this is year. really this one used to. In the past, we had two separate correct policies. <laughs> one of which was one line, and the other which was one paragraph, which is the one we're going to be repealing, which is the next policy to look at. And so we are just we think the MASC policy does a nice job of combining the two. Any further discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? Uh, I move to repeal policy CF entitled School Committee dash Superintendent Relations under the section General School Administration. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? <laughs> I move to approve the first the first reading of revised policy BBF titled Advisory Committees to School Committee under the section School Committee Operations. So the only thing new here is um, section five. Correct. And the open meeting law applies if we have three or more school committee members on any of those subcommittees, which we don't. So um, correct. And, and I, if I recall, the MASC just said just updates to the open law. The reason for the modification was updates to open law legislation. And so we just want to make sure we are in compliance with the laws. Any further discussion? Do we, oh wait, do you have a motion? We don't have a motion, do we? Did you make I, a motion I already? Moved, yeah. oh. A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, unanimous. <coughs> just imagine how much fun this is at 7 a.m. now. I, yeah, I'll be there the next one. Um, I move to approve first reading of revised policy BCBB entitled notification of school committee meetings under the section school committee operations. Second. I'm, I'm just, look, just looking at this, I didn't, um, it says you have to give 40, minimum of 48 hours notice, right? But does it say where the notice has to be? Well. It doesn't, does it? Is that somewhere else in our? Because up above it does say town hall. Right. I don't remember if it said. So there's no, yeah. usually it would say it has to be, uh, it can be online on the district website, it has to be like two or three places on at town hall. Etc. And I don't see that here, so I'm kind of. Well, it does say it'll be filed with the town clerk at least 48 hours in advance. Right, but that doesn't say about where it. Um, I mean, the, the only. It's of a change. I think that's essentially a post. The only, the only, the only, and I'm going out a little bit on this, but I would say, number one, it says it's required by law, and it references the law. Oh, okay, so it's probably in that law. And that so, says. and then if what we wanted to do as best we could was make sure we didn't have to continue to amend anything so if you say something is is correct notice and then that law later changes we, we have, would have to go back and update our policies again and I'm assuming the law is uh, mass general law is 38 correct. Uh, colon 18 dash 25 it is correct. Yeah. so that probably says where you have yeah. to correct post. okay all right so we have a motion and a second any further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. opposed unanimous uh, I move to approve a first reading of Revised policy CEI entitled Evaluation of the Superintendent under Section General School Administration. <clears throat> Second. Looks like we're meeting all these uh, as, uh, as stipulated. So, uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? <clears throat> and now this next. This next uh, policy was, we think, combined with the last policy we just accepted about the procedure for evaluating superintendent. And so we are moving to repeal policy CEIA entitled Procedure for Evaluating the Superintendent of Schools under General School Administration. Second. 
for the discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? <clears throat> I move to approve first reading of revised policy DB entitled budget planning under the section fiscal management. Second. I was waiting for that. Any further discussion? This is just an addition that the superintendent will have overall responsibility for budget preparation. The only, the only comment I would make, mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Chairman, is that the next section is basically what we're adding here. Okay. The next policy if you look, right. that we're going to repeal. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? I move to repeal policy GAB entitled Budget Planning Involvement under the section Personnel. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous? <coughs> now the next policy, if I recall, I'm trying to look here. Brand new. What was that? Brand new. Yes, I think this is a, this is a, a new policy that MASC is suggesting, <coughs> which we thought was better than DCA, which was just very generic, and we thought the MASC policy was better, so we're proposing to add this. Um, so there is no, is there a current section DC, Mr. Bernard? There is not a current DC, and that's why this one, this new one will fit in that coding. Okay, so this is not a move to I guess this is a move to approve a first reading of policy DC, DC right. entitled annual budget Correct. under the section fiscal management. Second. For the discussion, it basically just outlines what the purpose of a budget is and it's strategic and not just a bunch of numbers thrown together on a spreadsheet is Maybe if, if you wanted to. to uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? And I move to repeal policy DCA entitled Goals and Objectives under the section Fiscal Management. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous? This looks new to I too. move to appoint Mel to this policy. <laughs> no. I, I, the meetings would have to change. Um, so DFD. Again, it's going to be an, another new policy, I believe. And it is. there is no DFD currently. Correct. So this is a new policy that is being recommended by MASC. So I move to approve for first reading policy DFD entitled Funding Proposals and Applications under the section Fiscal Management. Second. Is the first line supposed to say the school committee? Because it says the school committee and or his, her designee. So that doesn't. It would be their designee if it was supposed to be school committee. The rest of it says the superintendent. I'm assuming the first one is supposed to be the superintendent also, or the school committee without and or his, her designee. Not necessarily. It could well, just but be it's a encouraging. But it's encouraging the administration. the administration. I think it is supposed to be the school committee, but I think you're right. The pronoun. No, but why would so it's why would the school committee? I know what you're saying. Yeah. So the rest of it is the school committee should encourage the administration and then basically the administration then reports, moves the process along and reports back to the school committee. But you don't need any pronoun. You could just say the school committee right. will encourage. The school committee will encourage. Right. That's what I was. Yeah. If that's the way. But you're right, Mel. That's a good question. What did they want to I think if, if I recall, I, I'm trying to recall the conversation. We had a lot of conversations on all these policies. And I think this was just, I think a lot of what is happening already is Mr. Bernard is encouraging people to try to find other funding sources. And so I think that might have been what we were trying to do is either that we, we obviously would like that, but Mr. Bernard's already doing a lot of that. Right. The, I'll check on the language. But it's referring to the school committee as a his or a yeah, her. I know what you're see how that. Singular plural right. disconnect of the, yeah. So I think we should probably pull this aside table right this I'll, one, I'll, yeah. I'll look and see what Ian. Look what MASC uh, needs wrote. Some clarification. Okay. okay. We, it would be nice to save one for next meeting. Yeah. Oh, we have more. Oh, we have a lot. Oh, okay. We have 99 right. policies. The next one's on smoking, Mr. Buckley. Correct. So we move, I move to approve a first reading of, revi of a 
This is a revised policy, correct? It is. Yeah, so the revised policy, the GBRM, which is entitled smoking under the section personnel professional. Second. Any discussion? Basically just adding the fact that e-cigarettes e and vaping right. is prohibited. My only question is for e-cigarettes, should there be a dash? Or is it just e-cigarettes like that? Pretty sure it's just like that. You can check on that. Any further discussion? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask. All's in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. <clears throat> and I move to approve a first reading of is this, yeah, is this a revised policy? Yes. Yeah, yes, because it, it's the back of the record. Oh, okay. Revised policy KCAA entitled Public Participation at School Committee Meetings under the section General Public Relations. No. Um, second. <laughs> this is interesting. On number three, it talks about topics for public. public discussion or uh, public presentation, public comment. And it says the topics must be limited to those items listed on the agenda. We've never limited that in the past. Well, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Dr. Troughton did enforce yeah. that policy. I, I don't agree with that. I don't know if you do, but. And I don't agree with it at all. In fact, I basically, when I was chair, that's when we started accepting comment without it being on the agenda, so. So it looks like. When was that policy last revised? Uh, 2011. 2011. Yeah. 2012. So we must have approved it then. So was well, that from the, MASC? This is no, the, no, this no. is the MASC. I, I, I don't want to get Mellif. Look at BCBIA. On the back? Oh, this Public one. Public participation throughout a regularly scheduled meeting will be left on the discretion of the chairperson. Right. And that's the way we've been doing it. Right. I, I don't. I don't agree with this policy. Oh, that's that's what we've been doing since 2000. It goes back beyond before that, actually. One, I think people should be allowed to speak on whatever topic they would like, pr provided it's germane to the school committee and the school system. And second, I think we should have the option um, to let people speak during the committee meeting. meeting. Although it does, like, I think it says- Well, the, at, in the very beginning, number one says at the start of each meeting, right? people can address anything it they want to be invited. Them. So I wonder if, if one and three are supposed to be two different well, things, I that if you want to talk about something that's not on the agenda, you can do it I don't in the public the mutual, participation I don't think part. Mutual I think you could have people participate, but the discussion is limited to those items on the agenda. So, so would you want to just clarify that? Yeah, but we have I don't agree. With, no, no, I don't want to clarify that. I, I won't approve. I won't vote. Personally, I won't vo vote for any policy that has number three in it. And I agree because it's never been our policy. It hasn't been our right. policy for a long time. Right. But my, my question was, what if those topics, you, you can raise any topic you want at the beginning of the meeting. Right. Yeah, but I think that's at the meeting. Isn't that what this refers to? Mm. No, Scott, no, what I do is I just, I just citizens. make number three public participation take, throughout take a regularly out. scheduled meeting with left to the discretion of the chairperson. Yeah. That's what I would put in. Take out the number three, the number three in red. Right, Mel? Yeah. Replace it with Take out the three, three in red and put this it with public participation statement here. Yeah. C B B I A. <laughs> yeah. Replace it with that. We, there's no Bicky or Bo. Uh, no. Wait, so what are you proposing to, to switch it with? Switch three on three the with existing the policy. I'm not three in the existing with policy. With this one, the public, public participation. Public, public participation section. Uh, it's like the fourth paragraph down, Julie. Yeah. And put that as number three on KCAA. So I move to approve a first reading of revised policy K, KCAA with the modification that section three will be replaced with public participation throughout a regularly scheduled meeting will be left to the discretion of the chairperson. A second. Oh, and, and I should under section, uh, entitled public participation at school committee meetings under the general public relations section. Second. Any further discussion? Yes. Go ahead. Does it flow with how it's itemized does that sentence flow is it consistent are you saying it should be up further or is right no, i 
think it works fine. It works fine. I think it works right there because in the next four, three or four, they get into the kinds of remarks that are allowed and not allowed, like you can't defame or abuse anybody or talk about personnel matters. Um, so I think it fits there. But when it comes back for the second reading, if it doesn't, we can always change yeah, it then. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve the revised policy as amended tonight. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. We're getting rid of number three, and we're replacing the third. No, the fourth one. The fourth it one. says public one participation. Public participation. Throughout a regular meet, scheduled be meeting, we've we'll left to the discretion of the chairperson. Okay. And I move to repeal policy BCBIA entitled public participation, regularly scheduled meeting under the section school committee operations. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, unanimous. Thank you, policy subcommittee. Thank Excellent you. job. Excellent job. Really need to step up the pace, though. I usually do slow these meetings down. I were late. <laughs> okay, next we have a presentation from Superintendent Bernard. It's his year two update on NRPS 2021 as strategy for the future. And he has presentations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in your packet, you should have a copy of the PowerPoint that I'm going to be referring to to guide um, an update to the district's strategic plan. As I mentioned, I think at the last meeting, I, I very much appreciate the committee's um, support of and investment in the district strategic plan. The administrative team, with the input of the faculty and staff, puts a great deal of time and energy into um, into using this document to kind of chart our our future for the district, and so your support of it um, does not fall on deaf ears. I, I make it very known to the, to the faculty and staff of the district that, um, that this is a document that is widely uh, utilized in our discussions around budget and also in, in just our overall strategic planning and the setting of your goals that you do um, each summer, so I thank you for that. Just as a reminder for you, um, kind of at the, at the root of um, NRPS 2021, which um, has, has now we're actually into um, year seven. If you remember, we had NRPS 2016, which was the first, kind of the inaugural five-year strategic plan. NRPS 2021 is the, um, is the successor strategic plan, and it all stemmed from the administrative team's reading of the book, Strategy in Action, and we continue to use that as a blueprint to kind of chart the course of the district um, for a five-year period. And essentially what this slide is, is, is uh, achieving is to, to demonstrate that what happens in classrooms every day um, represents the, the kind of what we hope for is the solid interaction between students and teachers around the content of each classroom. I think it's important just to kind of call attention once again to the vision and, and on the next slide will be the mission of the school district. Our vision is kind of the bumper sticker, if you will, kind of the, the the, the slang that we use to kind of just capture what it is we do in our, in our district each day, and that is we hope to prepare all students to be productive citizens who thrive in the 21st century. <laughs> Extending that is the mission, which centers on core values, and in this slide you'll notice the dedication to excellence, service, and lifelong learning. Those tend to be um, the representative core values of the district, and we continue to use the vision and the mission to drive not only the development of the strategic plan, but also our daily work. Just as a reminder, um, what, what NRPS 2021 captures is that we, we have kind of a, a hub in the middle and the seven spokes around that hub are the strategic objectives and there are seven of those and I'm gonna talk to you about, about those a little bit more specifically um, in just a moment. But each of those strategic objectives has been linked to the teacher and administrator standards of the present educator evaluation system. The importance I think of that is that as the school committee sets its goals, as the superintendent sets his goals, as uh, I work with administrators in setting their goals and administrators then work with teachers in, in establishing their goals, that there's a connectivity among all of those that I think is very important because we don't have one group or one person going off somewhere a little bit rogue, but instead everybody is kind of working in sync. And I think that NRPS 2021, our strategic plan, has gone a long way to achieve that. There are three major strategy areas under which each of the seven strategic objectives falls. 
Um, you might remember that we've, we've uh, continuously referred to these as the big rocks. These are the kind of the things that go in the jar, and they're the, uh, the non-negotiables. They, they are the teaching and learning strategy, the technology integration strategy, and the student support services strategy. Those are kind of the umbrella strategy areas from which the strategic objectives um, stem. So I do want to spend just a moment talking to you about the seven strategic objectives. Under the teaching and learning umbrella, we have to ensure that the district's K-12 curriculum is vertically and horizontally aligned to the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks as is applicable. And second, to attain instructional core initiatives by number one, hiring and retaining highly qualified educators, providing professional development opportunities to explore best practices in curriculum instruction and assessment, Number three, utilizing multiple sources of data as a means of improving student achievement and enhancing student learning. And number four, supporting the responsible integration of technology for enhanced instruction and student learning. There were two strategic objectives with, underneath the uh, technology integration strategy, and they are to ensure effective digital learning across the district and to enhance the technology infrastructure and support system in the district. And under the student support services strategy, there are three strategic, strategic objectives. They are to ensure that all students have access to a high quality, free and appropriate education, to implement and monitor a consistent instructional process that focuses on student learning to measure individual student progress within the curriculum, and to evaluate safety protocols throughout the district and implement a safety plan that provides the safest and most secure environment for everyone in the school community. Within um, each of those seven strategic objectives, there are a number of goals and action plans, and those are all spelled out in pretty significant detail in the, in the, in the larger document of NRPS 2021, which now is uh, approaching 60 pages, actually. And again, this, this slide just, uh, just, I think, demonstrates what I think is the importance about the alignment and that each of these uh, goal-setting organizations, if you will, the committee, the school improvement plan goals that come from each of our five schools, the budget goals that, that you ultimately adopt each year, and all of the educator goal, goals. By having an alignment there, we hope that we elevate student achievement, and that's what I think NRPS 2021 has helped us to do, is to, is to continue to elevate our student achievement by having a, a very specific charted plan for where we hope the district will be um, at the end of its five-year life. As is the case uh, each summer, the administrative team comes together um, for two days in a retreat, and we, a large part of the work that we do over those two days is, is centered on revising the, um, the strategic plan and making adjustments to reflect those things that we've accomplished in the prior school year and making any adjustments that we might wanna make for, uh, for the coming school year. And what I'm, what I'm gonna now focus on in the next few slides for you is um, the work that came from the start of the summer retreat, and we've also continued that work in, into the fall. In fact, we have a strategy session coming up on uh, this coming Thursday when we will all be together to just make some final adjustments. So I, I think it's important now to kind of call out for you the focus areas under each of the strategic objectives. Um, for 2017-18, and under the teaching and learning strategic objective, we will be focusing on the vertical and horizontal alignment of curriculum. So this is a cross-grade level, and also then vertically um, from grade to grade, from school to school, whether it's elementary to middle or middle to high school. We continue to seek um, ways to um, enhance our curriculum leadership model. Those of you that have been around for a while know that that is something that has been on the agenda um, for, the, for the district administration for quite some time, but we just, quite honestly, have never been able to afford the model that we, that we hope to, but that continues to become um, you know, an area of focus for us in 2017-18. John, that, that issue also has ramifications on the contract and contract negotiations, it correct? It can, it can. So, I know in the past- Because of the stipend positions right. within the yeah. teacher's contract, yes. Yeah. The educator evaluation system, we're actually into year five. I think it's fair to say that that's gone well. We've now had people go through a two-year cycle, and I think we're in a place where, you know, it's, it's pretty widely understood on what the expectations are for each person who's evaluated under the, under the newer educator evaluation system. I'm gonna talk with you a little bit tonight under my supplemental report about um, the release of the 2017 MCAS results, but MCAS 2.0, we're kind of, that's now the new assessment, statewide assessment. I think it's fair to say that we are in very good position to um, be fully prepared to take an online computer-based test um, under the mandate of 2019. 
Um, the integration of technology, while it's technology integration is its own um, strategic objective, I think it would be irresponsible to not acknowledge that if we're going to effectively teach and, and students are going to effectively learn that we have to integrate technology into, um, into the work that teachers do with our students. And I'm very proud of the work that um, our data teams are doing at each of our schools. We, we, with your support, we instituted data team leaders um, two years ago. This is the third year now. Um, and they're doing some good work at helping, helping other teachers to analyze um, data to inform their practice. And I think um, they've made some very good strides in a, in a pretty short period of time. John, can you just talk a little bit more about that, how sure. that works at, perhaps at the elementary level, yeah, there's so a few people? I can. I can, I can talk about it. It's, kind of, it's similar at all five schools, okay. the three elementaries, the middle school, and the high school. So we have one faculty member that has been appointed by the principal to lead data teams in the analysis of state, statewide assessments. Okay. Um, and we do that to try to inform instruction. So there's one at each of the five schools, one person who's a full-time teacher. Um, that has this as an added responsibility. Just one person. One person, correct, yes. It's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. Well, that's some of it, something we've talked about before, about adding personnel in, in this area, mm -hmm. the data gathering and, and data correct. handling, because it is a lot. It is, and I'm, again, in my supplemental report tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about RADAR, which is a new kind of data report initiative that the state has released, and the data that's being provided to us there is, is very good, and I think can be very valuable, but it's another example where, you know, we just, we don't really have people that are in positions to do, I think, the level of work that I would like to see get done, but people just tend to take on, as you know, people tend, tend to take on additional responsibilities because they see, they see the value um, in, what the, in what the data is, is showing us and how it can be used to, to strengthen them. And this is separate from curriculum support. It is. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is year three of those folks okay. in place. It is separate from curriculum support. In some cases, it might be the same person. Right. But it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Under technology integration, we have a focus. You might recall um, with the you adopted um, the robotics course at the high school robotics academy last spring. That's a new course being offered at our at our high school um, this year. And also the Future Ready Schools. Um, North Reading is part of the Future Ready Initiative. Um, there's some very exciting work going on here around seven, what they refer to as seven gears, seven modules, if you will, that make up the Future Ready Schools um, initiative. They are curriculum instruction and assessment, um, the use of time, technology networks and hardware, data and privacy, community partnerships, professional learning and budget and resources. So what the administrative team has been doing starting at our retreat in the summer, and this work will also continue um, this coming Thursday at the administrative council meeting, is basically looking at technology and how it can be used to enhance personalized learning um, for every student. Um, so I think you're gonna see some, some very good work come about in the coming year that I'll be reporting back to you on how Future Ready has helped us to, um, to more effectively in integrate technology into our classrooms. Um, as you know, with the one, rollout of the one-to-one -one initiative, it now calls for the capital plan to have a certain amount of money appropriated each year so that we can advance the one-to-one -one distribution by a grade level each year. And as well, we also talked with you about this year and you adopted um, the idea that we would like to you know, start to infuse some money into upgrades and repairs of technology, particularly at the three elementary schools. John, I was wondering if you should add as a bullet point the um um, Wi-Fi upgrade at the three elementary schools, if that's a separate. The, the Wi-Fi upgrade, it does, it goes back a little bit to um, right here. Okay. Enhancing the technology infrastructure. We could not have been able to achieve that without, without the Wi-Fi upgrade. Um, professional development is obviously, you know, technology is just changing so rapidly. It's, it's just, it's, it, it never really, it never really stops and settles. It just kind of continues. Um, so we, we are, you know, continuing to be very supportive of professional development for our teachers. Um, and as well, the one-to-one -one initiative, as you all well know, we instituted that this year um, in grade seven at the middle school following last year's pilot. It's going very, very well. John, I just have one comment. Sure. Can you just share how the structure of the elementary tech integration people have changed? Yes. Um, I just heard about digital, it, so I thought that digital, digital the committee might be interested in hearing. Yeah, well, we had previously had, this year being the first year that we have gone to this kind of new model, if you will, is um, we had three digital learning specialists that rotated among the three schools, each with kind of an area of expertise that they would share with the other 
with the other two schools from wherever they started. What we went to this year was we, we placed one digital learning specialist in the school for the year. That was based on, I would say, two factors. The most significant of which was, I think, from the from the teachers and the principals at the schools, um, but it, because they felt the the kind of stop and restart with the transition of a person leaving and then coming in twice in a year was not always good, and that was kind of the more significant feedback that we received. The digital learning specialists themselves also spoke about their desire to kind of stay in the building for the year and develop the connections that they thought. Um, you know, they, they hoped would develop. So what we committed to was much like having the, the older model, we committed to that for two years. We're committed to this model for at least two years and we're gonna evaluate it at that time and see which of the two would be better. Great. So that what's happening now is whatever digital learning a specialist was assigned at, at the school, they're gonna stay until June at that one school. Student support services, there's a lot to be said in this one uh, as well, this strategic obje objective. You, you hear me talk a lot about one of my goals this year is about social emotional learning initiatives. Um, I actually went to a very good workshop last Thursday with, with Dr. Daly about some things that we're hoping to bring to, to um, North Reading. Um, I think it's fair to say that I spoke to you, I think, at, on the August school committee meeting and also at the opening day meeting about um, the interest in the Excel initiative that North Reading had applied to be a part of, but only, unfortunately, I think only nine of about 30 some odd districts were selected to, to participate across the, st the state. But what that did for me was show that there is great interest among our staff. I think I had somewhere around 22 people um, reach out to me when I was making the, um, the application to be a part of Excel, um, indicating that they wanted to be involved in some sort of social emotional uh, networking. And so, I'm looking, continuing to look at other ways in which we might be able to, to, to kind of capitalize on that interest. And I think it's fair to say that I have found some places where we're able to do that. We formed a social emotional um, learning task force that's up and running now. This is year three. Um, just a lot of good work, I think, going on to try to, you know, strengthen our culture in schools and just give our students the supports that they need to kind of do their best learning. And that's what's really rooted in, in kind of the whole social emotional learning um, world. We are continuing to strengthen our, our response to intervention and uh, Massachusetts tiered system of supports. Uh, again, these are these are kind of prescriptions for students that we utilize to kind of you know provide them with the supports they need without going through the special education process. Um, I think you're all pretty pretty well aware of our interest and our work around um, adding specialized programs for students with special needs to keep them in district. We've done a lot of that in just a very short period of time, and I can assure you that we are continuing to look at ways in which we can uh, keep North Reading students in North Reading for their, for their education. And lastly, why I think this, this uh, kind of last bullet of school safety and security um, is, is important to keep under student support services is it's our belief that um, for those people that come here and work and those students that come here and learn, that they can't do their best work and they can't learn at their best if they don't feel safe coming to school every day. So we've put a lot of em emphasis on um, the ALICE program, the COPSYNC 911 um, technology-based alert system, the Envoy sign-in, and I will be sharing with you probably somewhere around December, um, and it was one of my goals for my evaluation cycle, is a complete overhaul of our emergency operations plan um, that has been um, received the input of the fire chief, the deputy fire chief, the school resource officer, the police chief, um, and the two assistant principals um, at the middle school and the high school working with me to, to take this task on, which is probably about a year in the making. And it was, it was time, I think, once the middle school and the high school came together in one campus that we had to look at how um, we were you know, going to respond to an emergency situation given that you know, a very, pretty significant change in the structure of having two separate schools, the middle school and high school coming together as one, it required us to go in and do some, some pretty um, significant work around how we, would, how we would respond in this building now to an, to an event when we needed to, um, starkly different from, from what it would have been if we were in two separate schools. So you'll be seeing something as a draft, um, I would say sometime in the next month or two. And then I just have this last slide. These are just kind of things that come to us that we want to put some energy into. They may not necessarily be rooted in NRPS 2021, but in some cases, in fact, in most cases, we've now, in the update, included them. Um, and I'm just going to run through them rather quickly for you, but I just I think it's important for you to get a sense 
um, for the coming year? What are some other things that the administrative team is looking at with the staff? So school safety and security continues to be, you know, something that we all feel very important about. And, you know, as new things come our way, um, you know, I think it's fair to say we would be taking a very serious look at, at their possible implementation. Um, staffing, um, you know, I, I, I think the curriculum leadership is an area where I really think that we, with all due respect to the people that work as um, kind of uh, teachers in the um, in the curriculum leadership work, they're still their primary responsibility is still in the classroom teaching. Um, and I just I have not felt for quite some time back to when I was a principal and now as a superintendent that that model is the best that it could be. But it's the one we have, and how we refine it and how how we look to do something differently in the coming year is is up for discussion. But I think it's fair to say we're looking to. A lot has changed, and I think we need to, to keep up with what those changes are by, by looking at our curriculum leadership model and making some recommendations for, for improvement. Um, staffing to affect student-teacher ratios, particularly at the high school. It's no secret that I think we have a significant number of classes with populations that are at that 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 uh, enrollment that we just, we just don't feel is best. And then what are some new and expanded initiatives that we might want to take on? We're looking at STEM and STEAM, both at the middle school um, and the high school. We're looking at expansion of foreign language and continuing to um, expand our digital learning course offerings. I'm going to be coming to you in the spring, most likely, with a pretty exciting pathway that we're looking to adopt in computer science um, for the high school. Um, so again, just another area where we're continuing to look at. Um, social emotional learning, we have a number of committees in the district, um, a public awareness and understanding of social education, which has been, has been in existence for, I would venture to guess, probably as, as many as 10 years, continues to meet. We have a health and wellness committee, the social emotional task force that I um, spoke about just a moment ago. And then devo developing and assessing social emotional learning and growth mind workshops. That, that is an extension of the workshop that I went to with Patrick last Thursday that we're very seriously entertaining, bringing to North Reading. Um, starting in the summer of 2018. Digital learning, um, I think the one-to-one -one initiative is, is self-explanatory. I've talked to you before about my desire and goal to have a North Reading Public Schools app. Um, I think it's fair to say that I will have something um, to release um, on or around December 1st. That's, that's nearing completion. The leadership team, I, I had them engage in a book study. They very graciously agreed to, uh, to read a book with me, and we are reporting out on that. We started in the summer. It's called The Innovator's Mindset by George Koros, um, and it's just about technology, creativity, and how we can strengthen that in schools. We are about, I'll say, eight of 14 chapters in on the discussion. We're taking a look at a seal of biliteracy program. This is a, a, a program that would um, essentially provide a certificate of, of achievement for a student who demonstrates, I'll call it significant competency in, in foreign language. Um, there's great interest among the, the foreign language staff at both the middle school and the high school to, to introduce something like this. So we have a meeting set for November um, that we're very seriously looking at being able to to, to provide students upon graduation with something more um, that speaks to their having taken on um, foreign language as an area of particular interest in, as opposed to just meeting a graduation requirement. And then the last thing is parent university. I, and as part of my report to you tonight, I'm, uh, my supplemental report, I'm going to speak to you about um, where we are more specifically. But I'm very excited with the response that I've gotten to um, the faculty being involved with parent university. And I think we're going to have a really nice day um, for the community um, on Saturday, April 7th. And again, I'll, I'll save when I show you the survey results a little bit later tonight um, what some of the things are that we're thinking for for April. So with all of that said, um, that's kind of the annual update to NRPS 2021. Very much a live document that we refer to very regularly um, as we kind of continuously seek to improve as a school district. Questions, comments? Here. Yeah. Well, the, the only, only thing I would say, Mr. Bernard, is well, yes. thank you for the work. And <clears throat> I just, every time I real, read the strategy, I'm just thinking from a budget standpoint about how a lot of what we need to do requires funding and we just are limited on it. And if maybe you could speak a little bit about how you're able to, because it still seems like we're accomplishing most of the goals, even without being able to fund a lot of it. And if you can maybe speak to, you know, how how you're able to do that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think. 
I think if I was to really do a, a kind of a, a two-column chart with you all and, and show you the things that we hoped to do and the things that we actually accomplished, on its surface, it might look a little disappointing, that like you wanted to do all these things, but you really you were only able to do these. But I, I've never really felt that way because I, I, I think that why we get to the places where we sometimes get, and I think we obviously perform well, um, is largely by people believing in what they do and wanting the district to be something that they can be proud to say that they're a part of. And so people tend to take on a lot of additional responsibility. And I think sometimes while we might not get um, as an example, you know, could you, can, could you reasonably have two data team leaders in an elementary school or more? I think you could, but the people that are there believe in the value of what they're doing and so they kind of make it work. At some point though, that you're gonna be in a position where it's like how long can you s sustain that? Um, you know, I do, if I'm really honest, I, the, the thing that probably concerns me the most about those things that we've been seeking to do and haven't been able to really get to a place where I, I think we need to be long term is around the curriculum leadership. I think there's just so much coming that, and there's so much going on that people need to take part of outside of this district. And so every time we want to send them to a workshop that we think is really good, we're pulling them out of a class because they're all teachers that do the curriculum leadership work as, you know, like 20% of their regular work. And so we, we tend to be reluctant to do that on any kind of you know, large scale because it means that their time with their students is, is lessened because they're off somewhere learning something new that we want them to bring back to the district. Whereas if you had a model that was somewhat different, you might be able to you know, not have the sacrifice of them in front of their, their students because they're going off to a professional development workshop or leading a workshop with their, with their department or with their grade level. But I think, I think if we, we go into we go into NRPS 2021 with our w eyes wide open, when Michael's here and he's intimately involved in all the conversations, I think we, we are realistic enough that we try to strike a balance between what we really would love to have, but also being very mindful of, you know, what is the ability of the community to afford that? And so we try to temper that with what do we see as our, our highest priorities. But we never go into it with a question of like, if you had a blank check, what would you do? We don't go into it with that with that kind of a, a vision. We go into it with what do, we, what do we feel we really need right now, and then there may be a few wants kind of woven in, 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 in through that. But um, yeah. how are we able to get to where we are? I think it's, I think it's just representative of what, what people come here and do every day, and, and just, you know, they want, they, want, they want to be proud of saying, you know, that they work in North Reading, and that they, the, the students come here very well prepared, very well supported, and work with us to, to I think, um, you know, certainly at least advance our, our learning and maybe not always achieve our goals, but certainly work toward, you know, being close to achieving them if, if there's a case where we haven't. So I don't know, I'm hoping that's answered your question. Yes. Yeah? I, okay. I guess I'd add that uh, I think um, we've continued to do well or even do better at what we do well, but we've been restricted as to what we can add. And, and that, that to me is has been the main restriction of, of the budget, you know, expanding foreign language. Yeah. We've been able to add some courses, do the one-to-one -one, um, initiative and, and some other things, mm -hmm. but some of the things we've wanted to do, we haven't been able to do. Get down, you know, reduce the class, uh, the teacher-student yeah. ratio here at the high school, for example. So and I, mean, I don't look at I don't look at those requests that we make as luxuries. No, they're I not. I don't think any of you do either. No. I mean, they're not luxuries. They're, but when you start to when you start to have 28, 29, 30 students in a high school class, that's, that borders on being unacceptable. Yeah. You know, it's, I think, but it's, you have teachers that want to teach those courses when we offer a new course, and they'll make it work, you know. But at some point, you, you do have to kind of say to yourself, but are we sacrificing something else? Are we compromising something else? I don't think we're there yet, but I do, I do think to be able to sustain that over an extended period of time becomes more and more challenging. Julie? I mean, I think the curriculum leadership positions are of utmost importance. I think if we look at the new science standards, yeah. the soon to be changing ELA and math standards, I mean, I think that's something that we as a district should really put at the forefront of our thoughts for the coming budget season. And I think looking at other districts, we're probably one of the only ones that do not have curriculum leaders. Mm -hmm. I've been in many districts and 
that's kind of a staple, and I think I we've agree. gotten away with a lot. Yeah, I agree. But budget, less. I can tell you, budget is a huge. I'm not going to deny that budget is a huge issue there. It's oh, I, huge. I think it's been the only factor. Yeah. It's and, and, it's been the and, only reason why. Right. We haven't, there hasn't been from a lack of support from the right. committee or anybody else. It's and I'm saying is it it can come to the top of the budget list, which I I, I think I agree. You know, right now, 98 percent that that should be one of our top items. But we're going to have to cut somewhere else. I don't see how because it's not that's, that's it's not happening. inexpensive. Yeah, no, it's not. Right. I mean, it's been. I I spoke about it when I interviewed for this job, at the batch. My interview was at the batch. I spoke about something that I hadn't been able to accomplish as a principal. But sooner or later, it's, it affects the education I, of our I, kids. I, that's so. My point about it's the you sustainability. Know, so, I mean, I think we've we've managed with far less than we should have been. But I think we need to kind of bite the bullet and and fight for that. What we're mm -hmm. talking about here are full-time positions that aren't teaching positions, correct? That's, that would be that's one concept, right? One yep. one way to do it, but you mm -hmm. don't have to do it. That no, way. but whatever way we do it, it's going to cost. Right. It's going to cost a significant I mean, amount of money. The evaluation piece would be helpful, I think, too, but that would have to be administrative level. But that's one model. It doesn't have to be the model. Right. You know, whether it's Fewer teaching responsibilities. I mean, teachers um, need that support to help them do their job well. So I could not agree more. I, I, it's it's a priority area for us, but it has been for years. Right. And unfortunately, as Mr. Webster said, it just it ends up taking a back seat because the realities of the budget have forced us to kind of make tough decisions in the 11th hour. Well, then the other issue is, as Mr. Venezzi and I have been involved, it does <clears> become <throat> part of um, bargaining. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was to get three the, years ago. The and Teachers Association has to agree mm -hmm. to implement. We, we have to agree together to implement something. Well, we need to come up with a plan first. Well, we, we've had plans in the past. I'll, I'll just yeah. leave it at that right now. We have, but it still remains a focus area right. for us for this year. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we'll probably have some sort of plan again this year. I, I think you can assume that, yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything else? No, I was just going to comment that under student support services, it talks about ensure that all students have access to a high quality, free, and appropriate education. And, you know, the, the word free kind of jumps off the page at me when we consider what we talked about earlier with all the fees and uh, for, for different areas so again it comes down to budget and um, mm. I think our reach should be sometimes you know beyond our grasp but I, I think that's a good job John it's free if you want if you just want your student to go to school and not participate right. in anything right. other than classes it's free that's and not right not, and maybe not get here right and maybe not get here <laughs> exactly <laughs> right <laughs> then it would be free because you wouldn't have to pay for the bus and right but it's not right. We've talked about how it's not right, but at the same time, we have no options, and we're like most suburban districts in the state who have the same fees, yeah. or in some cases, higher. So anything else? All right. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sitting in there. Okay, before we leave um, new business, I actually had one thing I wanted to bring up earlier. Um, I spoke with Marcy Bailey the other day, and she is um, the new chair of the Substance Abuse Coalition, which is part of the CIT, and she is looking for a school committee volunteer for that. To, to serve on that committee as basically a liaison to us. It's not an official appointment. Um, I discussed someone who I thought would be interested, but um, if anybody, it, the next meeting, th she's been trying different meeting times because it involves, I think, teachers, students, um, school, com uh, school administration, et cetera. The next meeting is at three o'clock on uh, October 24th. I believe it's here somewhere. I don't know if it's here or down in, um, the essential admin offices. Um, but if anybody's interested. I'd be interested. Would you? Yeah. Unless somebody else wants to do it. We, we could have two. Do it? 
We could have two people also, couldn't we? Uh, it depends on what Massey wants, I guess. Aren't you already on that committee? No, I'm not on that committee. He's on CIT. Oh, okay. CIT, right? It was on CIT. Oh. You're not on CIT anymore? No, because of the other meetings I've um, pulled myself off. So Jerry's interested. Are you interested also? If Julie's interested, you do it. Is that who you were thinking of? <laughs> we talked about you because you have a younger one and a high school student. Sure. And Marcy said she was looking for, she'd like to get some input from someone who has kids in the, in the sure. schools. That doesn't mean I can go back and say we have well, two people interested. Well, perhaps if we have two people interested, we could work together to or make you could, sure that yeah. at least each meeting is covered. Yeah. So let me, let me go back. We don't have to take a vote That's or anything. Really, I mean, let me go back to Marcy. She might even say, you can have two people come. That'll, that'll be fine. So, so I'll let her know we have two people interested. Um, I can't. My youngest is graduating. It's the Substance Abuse Coalition, and it's part of the CIT, which is what the Community the Impact, Impact, Impact Team. Yeah. And Marcy's the new chairman of that. Um, a Amy's on that too, right? Because Amy was talking Amy about was, that yeah. too. I think John, sir, John is a part of that. I'm on CIT. Yeah. Are the principals? Oh, you're not, you're not on the substance abuse? No. Okay. Are there any principals? I think I, I think I could be. Okay. All right, so that's that. But I chair the, act, the K-12 action team, and I think that's kind of my charge. It's one other thing I'll mention under new business, and we'll move on there. I noticed today there's a, there's a, there's a bill in the State House um, that will require a minimum of 20-minute recesses at, I don't know if it was elementary and middle schools or elementary schools only. So it'll be interesting to see how that bill um, fares. Because, of course, it doesn't take into consideration that we might have to lengthen the school day which would mean we'd have to negotiate, negotiate, but that kind of never with the in the so right. I have with a the question: teachers. What happens if if the state passes it and we have to implement it? Do, do you have to go into the contracts and re renegotiate? If that? it makes the school day longer, because if if you need or you cut from academic time. or you cut from academic yeah, time, but you need to have enough time in yeah. learning yeah. and still meet the nine hundred right. Hours, right. Yeah. So, but I just wanted to mention that it'll be interesting to follow that. See what happens. Okay, um, routine matters, minutes. We have the regular meeting of the school committee, September 25th, 2017. We'll take a motion to approve, unless anybody found anything. I didn't find anything. Motion to approve open session, September 25th, or 2017. Second. Further discussion? All's in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Then we have the um, October 2nd, which was our pre-town meeting, and then we adjourn to the town meeting, our pre-town meeting meeting, and then our participation in town meeting. Uh, motion mm. to approve open session prior to town meeting, October 2nd, 2017. Second. For the discussion? All's in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Budget update, nothing, Michael? Not this. No, uh, next. Staffing? Day. Nothing staffing? No, no staffing. Bids and donations. There's a lot of them tonight. Who gets the? Julie does it I'll better do than them. anybody. Nope. <laughs> okay. I would like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $50 from Philip and Kathleen Buston to purchase classroom supplies for the RISE program at the middle school. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation from Tom Lasden from Troop 750 of $67.77 on behalf to fundraise the benefit the North Reading High School Maskers Performing Arts Program. Second. For the discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? John, on, on that one, is this the, is that the student who built the? It is. It is. Yeah. So this you did was a nice job on that. You did a very nice job. So this was surplus from the money oh, okay. yeah, yeah. that he just donated back to. He picked a, oh, that a group nice. that he wanted to donate That's to. Nice. It was maskers. Yeah. yeah. Right. Excellent. Okay, I would like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation from Shalaka Taneha in totaling $260 to purchase classroom supplies for the Bachelor School. Second. For the discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of 30 lacrosse sticks, 30 indoor balls, and a curriculum guide with a total value of $500 to develop a new lacrosse unit for grades six, seven, and eight at the middle school from the North Reading Youth Lacrosse Association. That's really cool. Second. For the discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $500 to support costs associated with the Parent University Initiative at the North Reading Public Schools from Jeffrey Simons. Second. For the discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,500 to purchase a large color printer for student artwork at NRHS from Jeffrey Simons. Second. For the discussion, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I just want to mention, uh, we have a lot of great um, supporters of schools, but Jeff Simons has been um, not only financially, but has been there for every school project we've tried to complete in this town, every override. Number every one cheerleader. He is just, uh, the guy is. Uh, you need him on your side. His, his kids are all he, done with school, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, they're long time ago. Oh, no, yeah, his long youngest. time ago. His youngest, I think, is 25, my daughter's age, yeah, so, yeah. or 26. So Jeff donated the sign out on the field. The oh, right. Uh, sign this out on the uh, yep. football field. Yep. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of materials valued at $1,757.41 from the North Reading Youth Services yeah. to support the health yeah. curriculum at the middle yeah. school. That's excellent. Nice. Second. Mm -hmm. Motion to second. For the discussion, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Glad to see we've picked up uh, again on the uh, donation. <laughs> this is an excellent uh, batch here. Again, thank you to everybody in the community and uh, the organizations that support our school system. I also will add, this isn't a donation, but um, I've reached out to youth softball, girls softball related to the scoreboard um, project at the, uh, I haven't heard anything back yet, but I have reached out to them. Um, hopefully to get a scoreboard before next uh, for next spring. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the only other thing I would mention in this section is just that, just to recognize the efforts of the Batchelder parent yeah. teacher organization. They attended the uh, <coughs> their auction on Friday night and it was sold out. They had standing room only. They raised a lot of money and again, it was, it was a fun event and just recognizes when we talk about how stretched we are on budget. <coughs> how much the parents come together in this town to support the needs of the community. I heard it was a, a bang up success. I haven't seen the numbers yet, especially where the batch is celebrating its 100th uh, anniversary or birthday. We haven't decided yet which one it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just upset that I didn't win the trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to register that right now. <laughs> but I think a teacher a won. A teacher won. A teacher won and oh, she was, really? yeah. Mm -hmm. What was her name? Um, Johnson. Johnson? Yes. Oh yeah! Oh, she good. was so she excited. I was sick for a week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she is. and they actually they had they had they did it on did a live, live video on Facebook, Facebook, and she was she was it. thrilled. She was know. like she couldn't believe it. So anyway, that was great. Much deserved. Yes. Okay. Next subcommittee updates. We have none. We haven't had a subcommittee meeting in the last two weeks. I have my three kids with you. Subcommittee schedule. We have athletic subcommittee tomorrow at twelve thirty. We have the. Um, Early Bird Catches the Warm Policy Subcommittee on uh, Wednesday at 7 a.m. Uh, we have SSBC next Tuesday at 5.30. We have NORCAM October 26th at 7 p.m. And then we have Finance Planning Team November 2nd at 8.15. No, I think that one's at 8, John, isn't it? Did they change it to 8? No, it was... It was oh, that was a previous one? That was the was, Thursday. Okay. I think we were going to move to 8 because okay. I had a 9.30. All right, at 8.15. Administrative report, Mr. Bernard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So a few things I want to just highlight for you. I spoke earlier about the, um, the radar reports. This is um, resource allocation and district action reports. This is a uh, new source of data the Department of Education has been um, supplying to districts um, as of this year. It was piloted with a number of districts last year. I think there were nine or so. Um, but in any event, what I wanted to let you know was um, of the 10 
districts in the SEAM community, SEAM collaborative community. Seven of us have um, collaboratively written uh, an application for a grant, which uh, could be upwards of $100,000 if we were to receive it. The, grants are, the grant applications are actually due tomorrow. Um, we will be fine with our submission. All edit, final edits were made today. But what we're seeking to do is to um, use the data that was provi provided by the radar reports to um, seek instructional coaching around inclusionary practices in our seven school districts. So that's kind of the overarching goal is that if we, are, if we were able to secure the funds that we would have somebody that would um, be a so-called expert in inclusionary practices working with our teachers in uh, professional development across the seven school districts. So um, it could be a one-year appropriation, it could be a two-year appropriation. We've submitted for both, but um, once the application goes in and we, we have uh, an answer, I'll certainly keep you up to date on that. But I thought it was important for you to know that, <clears throat> you know, it's another example where we're, we're seeking to um, be the beneficiary of some grant opportunities from the state. The, the second item I want to share with you is that today I received the embargoed um, preliminary MCAS 2.0 uh, assessment results. There's going to be a public release on Wednesday, and I thought it was important that you be aware that that's coming. Um, some strikingly different data this year. There is the, essentially the new accountability system is taking over, so it's kind of it's almost like a held harmless year for grades three through eight. Um, only the high school will still be under the, the old accountability system because its test is still under the what's now being termed the legacy MCAS. That's what the term is being used to to identify the. MCAS prior to 2.0. I'm expecting to receive um, student reports on October 24th, and I'm expecting that we will have a presentation for you on October 30th um, on North Reading's performance, and that we will be sending out the individual reports to families on or around November 1st. So again, Embargoed results were received today. There's going to, you're going to see publications in the, in, the, in the, I would imagine, the Boston media on Wednesday, the 18th, individual reports on the 24th, a report to you on the 30th, and then mailing out the individual reports to families on, uh, on or around November 1st. So it's interesting. MASC did a lot of social media today around related to this. And what I read, what I got out of it was, warning, you're not going to like these results. They're going to be a lot lower. In the past, there's going to be a lot fewer students in exceeding expectations category, and a lot more in the meeting and um, partially, whatever, partially, partially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because yeah, so the, the I attached with you for you tonight a letter um, that actually is a is an updated version. I had gotten a letter from Acting Commissioner Wolfson on Friday that they amended at about 5.30 tonight, actually. And so I, got, I was sneaked it into your packet here. With, it, was, it was about two pages longer than the original letter, and I was actually glad that it was. But I don't think that point that you just made is, is off base, Mel. Um, the accountability ratings are different. It, what was advanced proficient needs improvement and warning or failing, depending right, on they're the all grade different, level, yeah. is exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting expectations, or not meeting expectations. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's probable that you're going to see that range of students that maybe had been in the uh, proficient needs improvement melding into the kind of the not meeting expectations range, but there's some very specific language around what that means. And on the surface, it's almost like, I, I think it, it, to try and draw a comparison between how students performed, how, how your child might have performed last year and the rating and the, and the performance that they have this year is almost there. I mean. They're telling you don't even attempt to try and do that, but it's natural, I think, for people to try to, to, do, to do that. But if we can convince people in our, in our messaging is that the system is different this year than it was last year, and we're going to do our best to kind of hammer that home, then I think people will come to the determination that you're comparing apples to oranges. Right. I think the other message was is... Except at the high school. The students are still performing well compared, compared to the rest of the nation. Correct. But we're, make, we're making our standards tougher. Was there any reference to the NAEP in what you saw? Yes. With MAS? Yes. Yeah. That we'd likely see yeah. results that are similar. Mirroring to that, of which, which is very good. And North right. Reading has participated in NAEP a couple right. of times now. I, I was on a conference call with Patrick Daly Thursday. We learned a lot. We did another one today, which was very different than the one Thursday. So I was glad we did it today with three of our principals. And there's one more tomorrow. Um, so there's been some very good communication. I think there's something 
The fact that we received results today and they've been embargoed only until Wednesday morning is interesting. You know, I don't know why that window is so short. It's never been that. But I think well, it's we're late anyway. Well, we are later than normal. Yeah, we are. <laughs> so, but they could the have they could have still been right. given us the normal ten day window for the analysis. But I think I think they're I think it's another. I don't I don't know this because I didn't hear it. But my sense is that it's to kind of get people off of that thinking that I'm going to sit down and take the time to compare where we were last year to where we are this year, and they don't want you to do that. Well, that's my so my question to you is there, what what is actually actually going out on Wednesday, because. If there are results out and, you know, the Globe has online has them all and it shows sure. a, a North Reading Elementary School with 35 percent in not meeting expectations. I, and then the Facebook posts start. Yes. And, uh, hysteria I, starts. I just want to be prepared to well, deal with that. Well, I right, think that's we have to be careful, too, because the media could be looking at previous years. Right. What I, I can know? tell you, I can tell you what I know. And, and what that is, is last Wednesday, the executive director of MASS, the Mass Superintendents Association, spoke to the Merrimack Valley Superintendents Association about his conversations with the Department of Ed and their hopes for the messaging to the media. I would say that it's, I would characterize the, um, the message to, to us as superintendents was that, you know, a sense of optimism from MASS that the commissioner was hearing and, and the value and the importance of that message to say that this is very different and that his, his conversations with the media, you know, needed to, to strengthen that. The communications today out of the Department of Ed lead me to believe that there's optimism on their parts that they know the message that needs to go out to the media, which they're, I think they're actually doing that tomorrow in anticipation of the release on Wednesday. So my sense is they're trying to send that message that it's it's an apples to orange comparison so don't even try how well the media receives that i don't know that anybody can predict well, what exactly will be out on wednesday wednesday, wednesday well, is the it, release of the public release of the results well, will and it just show north reading or will it show all our schools i don't know that that's what i want to know because I don't know. my I mean, sense is at school my sense is it will have to be broken down because you have a three to eight system and you have a high school system so to not do, to do it only as a district just wouldn't make sense to me. It would have to, I think. So I guess there's I'm no leveling. There's no leveling of the elementary schools and the middle school. Remember how you used to have a level right. one, two, three. There's there's this none year, of that. There's no leveling. The unless, only reason you, you drop you, down is if you, you don't have 90 percent. It could only be a level three, right. right? And there's no there's no fours or fives this right. year. Now, is there a way for you to send us the data at a certain time on Wednesday when the embargo, sure, is lifted? Just for so our for our it. for our schools. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just go on Boston.com. Yeah, but I'd rather get it from John so I sure. know it's accurate. <laughs> no, I can. Yeah. You know, is, is this? I just it's embargoed until right to whatever Wednesday. time. It, yeah. yeah, I think it's two, noon. Is this letter going to be sent to all the parents then? This letter is going to go with the score reports, uh, assuming that he doesn't. It's not changed between now and the twenty fourth, okay. because, like I said, I, it's a different letter than I got last week. Yeah. But if if it's the same letter, that letter is going to be accompanying the reports, and our principals also send kind of their own. You know, they have their cover school, letters we send we always send kind of like a school based you know letter from the principal too and just in anticipating questions or concerns if if there are cover letters from the schools would you mind sending those along as well just so we know it was told to i will do my best to remember that yes i will try to remember that how is this going to affect the abigail the abigail adams and the other scholarship because it used to be it used to be a, uh, advanced a, a, right adv well you still have that system under the high school right? Oh, that's the high right. school system is still same, the same. same it's the only it's the only level it All is. Right. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. As it always is. That'll be a couple As of weeks. As it always is. Because we won't be sending them out until November. Just remind me, please. <laughs> I just want to know what was said to people before. Okay. Okay. Next. Next. Uh, Parent University. I just I thought I would include for you. There's a survey. Uh, results of a survey they administered, it's in your packet. I'm not going to walk you through it. It's, it's a little bit cumbersome, but I just thought it was interesting for you to see the kinds of topics that parents are saying they'd like to hear more about at Parent University. So these are the things that we're kind of zeroing in on. Oh, cool. um, I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be a, a, a good program. So you can see that mindfulness, stress reduction, so are you working with the scale of that percentage or that just number of <laughs> that, that percentage of 
percentages. Yes, percentage of respond people. John, there are a few other towns doing this. So you were the superintendents working together to kind of. Who did you? Well, Melrose and who else? I, it's they're just popping up everywhere. I know Andrews Burlington. I know Melrose, Burlington and Burlington. Wakefield. Yeah, those are the two I know of. Yeah. Um, but no, we're not. We're not. Um, we're not doing something jointly. It'd be interesting though afterwards to maybe compare some findings. There may be some things. Yeah, you know I, I mean? think I think the models are similar. Yeah. Um, but we're not like sitting in a room together saying, okay. "Is this what you want to do?" Type of thing. No. Right. No. That you could share happened. resources. Right. Like, oh yeah. This you could. Particular person you could. is great. Why don't you look? Yeah. No, you definitely could. But remind, remember, the, a lot of these are going to be offered by people within our district. Sure. These are our teachers running these workshops or, maybe can, or others. Maybe we can uh, rent them out and make some money for the district. <laughs> I like the way you think. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next thing I have is, is just um, I'm kind of required as the district's re representative to periodically update you with executive director reports from the SEAM Collaborative and the North Shore Education Consortium. So I've included, I've done this for you before. Um, so I've just given you a, a sample of each from a recent meeting that I attended for both both collaboratives. The next thing is just a reminder that um, we will be having a ceremony tomorrow um, at four o'clock right outside in the kind of the atrium area here to um, dedicate the distance learning lab in honor of, of Dr. Troton, Dr. David Troton, the former superintendent of schools. I'm hoping you can make it as your schedule allows. I think we have a nice program plan for about an hour long ceremony tomorrow. Um, and then Oh, I, I didn't, I, I don't mean to go backwards, but just very quickly, so we didn't talk about the coding system with your goals in the superintendent's report. Did you see what, it, yeah. did you see what I was trying to do there? You've done that before, right? No, or? I have with mine. This is the oh, first oh, one. Oh, so I like, see, okay. Um, LG is, is leadership and governance. Yeah. So LG, and then it's uh, item 3F1. Okay. Um, let's okay. see, on the next Page. You have FAM, that's finance and asset management. Yep. Okay, so that's that's the coding system I was I talked about at the last meeting. Just it might be helpful to you um, in tracking your level okay. of achievement toward meeting your goals. And then I'm I did that in my um, report as well. I've, I've always done it for my goals, but I'm doing it for yours now. So is one of your goals you wanted to do more in honoring uh, the celebrations of things that went on in the district? So I've asked the principals to share things with me um, when they come across their desk. So. We have, um, we have four students that were um, named as commended students. That's a, that's a pretty good number, four um, students to be a commended um, student in the PSAT and MSQT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, top 3% of 1.6 million test takers. And they are Sarah Buston, Owen DeClean, Monica Stancheva, and Emma Wall. And then Caitlin Galvin, who was here tonight, she's also one of our student reps. You haven't heard from her yet with a student report, but she was here for oh, the, yeah, the United yeah, Nations yeah. Conference. Has been named a Senate wow. semifinalist, which is approximately 1% of the 1.6 million test takers. So yeah, she, it's, it's she's gonna pretty significant. My, my she did a good job tonight, didn't she? Yeah, she's very articulate. She I also noticed right. that I, I spoke with Dave Johnson the other night at, at the football game, and he said that he is now um, honoring a student of the month yes. in athletics. So it might be good if we could bring those two. They, um, um, I, think they were, was, I think the first one was in the paper. On, I think it was uh, Kyle Bythrow and uh, Carly, Carly Beasy, right, for the yeah. first month. So if you could bring those in the future when he recognized them to the... School committee, something else for you to remember? I, I'm bringing forward those things that they tell me. Okay. <laughs> I'll make sure Mr. Johnson tells you. There's a lot, to, a lot of good to report. That's good. And this is, this is new, so I think it's just getting Great. off the ground. But, yes, we'll, we'll do our best to try to share Appreciate as much it. good news with you as we can. Appreciate sir. that. As I said, we, we want to recognize it's good stuff. the good stuff happening. Okay. Um, John, there was one thing, and I don't know if you yes. have any info. I was going to bring it up under the SSBC MSBA, and I forgot. The, uh, the cooling tower drainage issue. Is there yes. anything to... I can talk to you about this. So we've scheduled a meeting for 845. On well, maybe we yes. should explain it first. So there's the cooling tower is a draining into the wastewater treatment plant. The cooling tower essentially is the system that when we operate the air conditioning or the coo air cooling, cooling of the air, I guess, um, conditioning of the air, um, essentially when, when we operate that system, there is a, a what's referred to as a dump of the system. And it's, it's the, the water... The condens it's the condensation that builds up from the running of that system. Um, when it flushes, that water is piped into the wastewater treatment plant. There's a little bit 
Would you say that there's a little bit of disagreement on whether or not that system needed to be piped into the wastewater treatment plant? I think plant? so, I think yeah. There's disagreement yeah. among whether or not that needs to be. Mm-hmm. Bottom line is it is. It's, it's piped in there right now. It does, this does not happen continuously. No. I think it happens probably twice a year, would you say, Michael? Yeah, it builds Peak up over season. time. And then it seemed end. to happen yeah. a couple times recently, and it seemed to happen. It was a much it larger. Happened, it only happened once about, was, about three weeks ago. A much larger amount of water than they expected, the way I read it. Um, no, I think that they're expecting the amount. It's just it, what it is is it creates an unexpected amount in the system in the plant itself. Right. But the amount that comes from the cooling. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. is pretty. You know, I think you can pretty pretty much they pretty much know what to expect. But they just don't. The wastewater treatment operator doesn't know when it's coming. When it's coming. Right. And so consequently, you know, what can't be prepared. Well, bottom line is that water is is contaminated and it and it's affecting the waste the operation yeah. of the wastewater treatment plant. So. Basically, um, I think I copied you on that on that letter that I got. So we've arranged for a meeting at, on Wednesday morning at 8:45 to see what alternatives there might be. We we've kind of, I'll say, we've been we've been taught we've been pursuing uh, with Wayne's help. Um, is there a possibility of you know an exterior tank that it it gets piped to, and therefore bypasses the wastewater treatment plant, much like we do with our science. Tight tanks. We have tight tanks from the chemical labs that. Um, yeah, well, those tight tanks cost a small fortune. So they well, we do, and and we we know that Jerry, and we we were aware of that. I did also talk to the town administrator about this on last Tuesday. I wanted him to be aware because I think whatever remedy we come up with, if we do decide, if it gets decided that we're going to bypass the wastewater treatment plant, um, is going to be expensive, and if we don't bypass the wastewater treatment plant. I think what we need to do to prepare for when it does happen is also pretty significant. My concern in reading that letter was, and I may have read this wrong, was that the letter was almost saying, if you continue to do this, the wastewater treatment plant is going to stop operating the way it's supposed to operate. That, that's kind of the way I read. I, I, I don't think you misread. I don't think you're wrong in that interpretation. But I, I, until I have the people in front of me on Wednesday, it's hard for me to say what was the intent. Well, the, the, of that it's a real concern. For, this has been an issue for three years. I know, but Jerry, yeah. now it's. I understand. They're I basically know. saying it's, it kills the bacteria. That's now. essentially they have to, what happened. They have to pump. But that's how we it was had designed. To a lot of, a lot of well, no, how... no. The, the cooling towers probably contains. I'm going to guess uh, materials that you put that in compromise there. Compromise the yeah. freezing yeah. And, and things like that. Like antifreeze. But what you're, yeah. what you're asking right. is, oh, it was designed, designed to put, yes, we're not doing, right. we're not doing anything wrong. No, right. No. right. This right. is the way it was designed. Was, and it's right. been an issue. Right. And we, right. we had a meeting, we had a meeting in June of 2016. It, right. So someone should have known that this was not okay to do. Right. So I guess my right. question is, but the know. people that design it are arguing that it is appropriate that to do. Okay. That's why I say there's disagreement right. around. And the DEP awarded the permit knowing that. Knowing that it was tied. We raised this in June of 2016. So over a year ago, we had a meeting in the high school conference room. Yeah, right? we did. We had everybody Everyone in there. Was there. The yeah. architects, the, the engineer that we have contracted with for the operations of the wastewater treatment plant, the wastewater treatment operator was here. Um, so it's not something that's like all of a sudden has caught us off guard, and we're not operating anything in a way that we shouldn't be. It's just I think I think what Martin, I mean, uh, Weston and Sampson, the operator of the wastewater treatment plant, is saying that if you continue to have this system and stand by it for the long term, we're not so sure that, like, we can properly maintain it because exactly. it starts, you know, once once you kill off all of the bacteria yeah. that treats the waste that goes into the system, it's, it's like it's that has working. to somehow be, we've explored whether or not there could be some, some other organic treatment, you know, at the cooling tower site, so before it goes, and they're telling us that there isn't, so... John, my question is when you talk about cost, right? Mm-hmm. Someone's, the DEP approved this. Whoever designed it said it was designed properly. And yet we have the experts who are running our wastewater treatment plant saying it shouldn't be happening. That's exactly right. So, so how can it be designed properly? I don't, I don't understand it. And I think if you're going to talk about cost here, I mean, I'm not a guy saying let's file another lawsuit. But if we have to talk about cost here, then there's an issue with design. Well, I think you have to look at the whole picture because honestly, that system's been in place and working the same way for three plus years. So I don't know whether this is something that takes a long period of time to impact the waste. I think they're saying over time but, it will. But it's been three plus years. That That's correct. Running that system and it's been draining the exact same way. Yeah, it's only been, I mean, there's been a couple of times where it's just completely 
kind of shocked the system in two instances. Yeah. And that's what that's what happened. It's right. happening two like or three once weeks every, ago. you know, 12 months or so where we have to just shut the system down and then spend two or three days pumping. Right. right. And see, that's... And then get it to start That's running costing again. money, replenish, right? Replenish, replenish money, yeah. the uh, bacteria. Yeah. Right. So they have to Grow pump the, the whole... That, that, to me, doesn't sound like a proper design. You, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't sound like a system, let's pump it and make it cost... Yeah, you want to avoid pumping. It yeah. would have seemed to me that like a tight tank operation would have right. been the thing to do as a total layman on it. But right. like, it's for the same reason we do the science labs. They, they're bypassed. They're, it's a tank. It fills. There's an alarm that goes off, and it tells you that you have so much you know, gallonage to go. You need to have it pumped, and that's what we do. We have two of them. We have two, one for middle school, one for the right. high school. I would recommend this be a topic on the SSBC agenda next week. It's up to you. Yeah, but. no, I, I can't. I'm not going to be at that meeting. Remember, I told you that's the one. Oh, well, yeah. It's the last meeting. I can't be there. Oh, we can certainly. I think it Mike, Michael Gilberto is aware of it. Um, oh, we can certainly raise I don't think we're going to have anybody here from. I, I think, unfortunately, I think or, the people, yeah, it's, it's a door and Whittier. Um, it's a door and Whittier design. But you, when are you meeting with the people next tomorrow? Wednesday. Or Wednesday, okay. Right after policy subcommittee. All right, I just wanted to bring that up because I, I have some real concerns about that, and obviously we have to keep our eye on it. I think your assessment of the letter that was sent, though, is pretty much how I'm reading it, too. So. Yeah, that's similar. Yeah, Michael, you, you were on it, too. So. No correspondence at this time? Uh, no correspondence, sir. We have our next meeting, regular meeting, October 30th here, and then November 13th here. Anybody have anything else? Uh, I'm, out of, I'm out of and another thing right now. That's it. Okay, I'll obtain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Good night. Ooh.